I'm Peter from The Daily Rios. And I'm Eric from Longbox Review. And this is episode 32 of Peter and Eric's Legion Project Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Legion Project Podcast. I am your host, Eric. And I'm Peter. And we are here to discuss issue 32 of the third volume of the Legion of Superheroes. Uh, And this issue is first of a four-issue saga. The Legionnaires are trapped on a world controlled by Universo, and they don't even know who they are. And given that this is issue 32, and uh, as it says on the cover uh, the Universal Project, Chapter One. This is kind of a momentous episode, isn't it, Peter? In a, in a sense, that's right. For a number of reasons. First of all, you know, if, if we continue our anniversary from some, from September, our four year anniversary, we're going to hit five years next year. That's crazy. Five years uh, later. Yeah. <laughs> We are celebrating, so we're continuing our anniversary. We're getting to the Universal Project, which is the whole reason that this podcast is named. Um, when we were batting around names, we talked about this in an earlier episode, but when we were batting around names, um, we hit on this this idea, the, the Legion Project. You know, instead of the Universal Project, we have the Legion Project as a way to, and it has been kind of like, you know, we, we talked about this off mic, the construction of our podcast, we didn't want to go back to the beginning. Way too often podcasters, they want to talk about something and they say, I want to go back to the beginning, 1950, whatever, 1963. Now, if I want to do the next an X-Men podcast, I'm going back to the first. It's like, okay, suffer through those Stanley Jack Kirby issues. <laughs> if you have to. Um, so we didn't want to do that probably before the creation of the title we we initially thought we were going to talk about the five years later legion uh but then we said you know what eric hasn't really read a good portion of the baxter run there are some issues uh, that i'm finding more and more that i haven't read it is one of my favorite runs and it is the first I'm saying it is the first Legion run to start with an issue one. Yes, there was another Legion of Superheroes issue one, but it was was only like six issues, you know, and it was, was that reprint material? I can't uh, yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. it was all, all, all four issues were reprint, I believe. Right. You know, and then there's Secrets of the Legion of Superheroes, but that's a mini series. Yeah, you know, that's blah, different. Blah, blah. This is an entire volume, as we talked about way back in episode one, that was, you know, celebrating the Legion's popularity, celebrating the very paper quality it was on, celebrating new ideas and 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 all 60, 63 issues plus annuals. It was an event. So we were like, okay, let's let's start there. This is a good good thing. And then I think the name probably came out of that. Oh, we're doing the Baxter Run, <gasps> Universal Project. Legion Project, done and done. Mm-hmm. Greatest podcast title ever. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, yeah, so we are celebrating um, the the very storyline that is our namesake. So it has a lot to live up to. I was just going to say that. Yeah, How, will it live up to the to the hype, to the name, to the to the the history? <laughs> I told you, no bad words. <laughs> this is going to be an all positive episode. Ooh. Um, <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. We're fighting. <laughs> we're going to fight on our anniversary. Uh, no, that's okay. So, yes, this is totally a celebration of, of our podcast and, and of the Legion in general. I mean, that's what, that's what it all is. And, and the project nature kind of spoke. I think I started this thought, thought and then didn't finish it. But this whole notion of project, right? We didn't know. We knew we were going to talk issue by issue every episode. And then it's kind of developed, right? Then we started talking about other Legion appearances at the time of those issues. 
And then, you know, just sort of recently, we've, we've been saying, you know what? No, we don't have to go back and review those older issues. But if they work well to help our discussion of the Baxter run, that's the way to read those o- older issues. It's kind of like um, to steal an old Uncanny X-Cast segment. It's sort of like a retro review, but it's different. It's sort mm-hmm. of like, a, uh, I don't know, just, just using re- re- retro research or something, you know? Yeah, it's, it's cited material. It's, right. it's, it's right. reference. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I like that. I like that that has now developed into a thing. And what I'm starting to do is check off which issues we've actually, I've actually read, you know, creating like a list so that I'm like, good. I don't ever have to read like, you know, (laughs) that, that original Universo story that takes forever to read and and he's barely in it, you know, I can, but then it's fun to kind of fit the stuff that I am reading, like maybe in future episodes, like, oh, here, here's where this story fits, which means it comes before this and after this. It's fun to see how the Legion stuff the Legion mythos lays out, but not in a publishing order. It's in a haphazard order. And we go, Oh, right. Okay. So you sort of making new discoveries. And it's, I think it's a, it's not the best way to go about the tapestry, but I like, I like filling in (laughs) it because it's filling in our gaps with what we're reading now. That's what I really like. Yeah. 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 We're adding to the, uh, to, to, to take your word, the tapestry of, of what we are discussing here with this volume. Right. Yeah. And, and like you, I, you know, I'm going through, I, I, I didn't make a list, but, <laughs> but uh, as I'm going through these old uh, Legion issues that uh, inform us or introduce characters or whatever, like you said, um, uh, these are things that I've not read. I have, I have, uh, I have the three or four omnibuses that, that uh, DC's put out so far now. And this is a great way to go actually read those. Mm-hmm. And and uh, and like like you said, I can read them. Like okay, I don't have to read that again. Thank God. Right. <laughs> so since you're jumping around in those omnibi, are you like dog earing some of the corners? That, no. <laughs> no. God, no. Putting little pencil marks. Oh, I read this. No. <laughs> can you imagine? No, but I what I do uh, what I should do that now that you're now that you brought it up. Thanks a lot, Peter. Um, I need to go into my my comic uh, uh, database app and uh, indicate that I read those issues for yeah. sure. I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure that because I I no no I, I was just say I think I have them uh, in issue format a uh, single issue format, but I don't I don't have all these uh, these adventure right. and action comics appearances and and you know that early, all that early stuff. So how am I going to do that? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to end up making a list like you did. <laughs> yep. See, I told you it's going to happen. And like, you know, you're, you're, you're the bigger Legion fan. Cause you're double dipping into a lot of this material, you know, the collections and stuff. I don't mm-hmm. do that. But so I read some of the stories on the DC app and, and then you go, and then what happens is I realize I do have those stories like in later reprint issues, like the two parter, that, that the Universal Project is based on is reprinted in Superboy and the Legion 238 from issue from 1978 under a new Jim Starlin cover, right? So I was like, oh, as I was like oh, looking that. through, mm-hmm, yeah. as I was looking through all of like various Universal, Universal appearances, which we said we, you know, we were going to do like, you know, for this episode, um, and and we both went back and read those two issues again, Adventure Comics three fifty nine and three sixty. Here they are reprinted, so I didn't have to read it in line, <laughs> online. I could have read it here. And Archie Goodwin, the new, or excuse me, Al Milgram, the new editor at the time, says uh, the reason they did this is because they were way behind schedule. So they were like, oh, let me just reprint <laughs> two classic tales. Mm-hmm. So, by the way. Issue 32 also is another momentous um, milestone, if you want to say. If we don't count the annuals, we are halfway through mm. the Baxter run. Right. Like the middle of issue 32 is, is the <laughs> middle point of the Baxter run. If we don't count the annuals, if we count the annuals, then we got to go up to issue four, but we could, we could really just say this entire story is kind of like the midway point Mm -hmm. of our, Mm -hmm. of our project. 
So that, that means uh, in another four years, we'll get to the end of the Legion? I guess that's what it means. Or this volume, this volume of the Legion. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> if we're lucky. I, I remember, Peter, when we were first discussing what this show would be, um, uh, uh, you had said, you know, we could, we could uh, get together on, uh, on a weekend morning and bang out three or four episodes, because that was the original idea, just do these real quick things, and, and then you'd have a, a stockpile of episodes to, to edit and release. And that's why that's why now four years later here we are yeah right right and you know we even talked about do we do more try to do more than one issue in an episode but i like the single issue format it it lets us dig deep yeah and um you know we'll get better a lot of the reason for our delays are just because i just don't edit fast enough you know because i get distracted or whatever so it's all on my shoulders that's okay <laughs> all right it's all right when a new episode drops, people get excited. Um, speaking of new, do you want to talk us through some new things that are coming up with the Legion? Yeah. So uh, even though we no longer have, or at least don't have right now, a uh, an ongoing Legion of Superheroes book, um, we do have a bit of news coming out of uh, around the the near the end of September and on, uh, and culminating in some recent news. So. Um, uh, like I said, in late September, um, Infinite Frontier number six from DC Comics, uh, which I have not read. I've only read issue one because uh, I'm reading that on the app, and that's the only issue they have so far. But I already have been spoiled <laughs> on this little tidbit, and I'm going to spoil it for you, our dear listeners, uh, in case you haven't read it yet. Um, anyway, there's a reference at the end of that issue to the Great Darkness and uh, that same phrase was used in uh, the, the latest ongoing series, uh, issue number nine. And so, you know, that, that was a little bit of a tidbit there, I think, from uh, Mr. Uh, Bendis. And uh, speaking of him, uh, he did an interview uh, about the Legion book, and he said that it is actively in production, written and being drawn as we speak. And I think that was around about the same time as, as this news from uh, uh, regarding the, the great darkness stuff. And I'm very excited about it. Also, there's some surprises around Legion that we'll be announcing soon, which I guess now, because I when I wrote this uh, bit of news, I only had the, this, this little bit of information, but it's only been just recently when the advanced solicits came out from DC Comics for, this would be January, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, We get the Justice League versus the Legion of Superheroes miniseries, which I believe is a six issue miniseries written by uh, written by Brian Michael Bendis and uh, with art by Scott Godlewski. And like I said, that that comes out in January. And so uh, here is, uh, I guess, the solicitation text for this. When the heroes discover that reality is falling to a great darkness In both times, simultaneously, the Justice League and the Legion of Superheroes must team up to stop it all. But what is the connection between the secrets of the new Gold Lanterns and the coming of the Great Darkness? A monumental DC epic event miniseries. We'll be the judge of that. Yeah, I was going to (laughs) say. You know, so my my first reaction to the, the very first bit of news was, um, is this just a reimagined great, dar- uh, great darkness saga? Are they just trying to tread this old ground again? Uh, or, or is this the, the, the reimagined version of the, well, I think I just said that reimagined version of the great darkness saga, right? So what, what are they, what, what's Bendis doing here? What, what, why are we getting the, these, these, uh, code words, you know, not what, what's the right word here? Yeah. Uh, uh, phrases or yeah, you know, trigger you know, phrases. <laughs> trigger Exactly. Trigger phrase, you know, for Legion, for Legion readers, that is, that's the, you know, that's, that's a huge one. So. Right. And, and there's no way the 12 issues or whatever it was and the future state Legion issues, there's no way. And whatever Bendis is doing in justice league that it is ready to have a great darkness. You know what I mean? Right. Um, the weight is not there. They haven't and, earned it. Yeah. 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 They really haven't. And, and, you know, from the little I read of that new series, it's like Legion in name only half the time, you know, <laughs> not, not to be, not to be harsh. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I mean, I don't want to prejudge, you know, I, I liked, I liked event Leviathan. I like 
if they kind of put a twist on the great darkness, then maybe that'll be fun. But it's kind of like the Thanos problem at Marvel. They overuse dark side a lot. Mm. And, mm -hmm. um, um, it's, is it their way to do a crisis story without calling it crisis, you know, spin it off into some other high concept phrase that that's in DC lexicon or lore or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it makes me wonder this pure speculation on my part well, that th that Bennis was working his way up to whatever this great darkness thing is but because perhaps the legion didn't take off quite as as well as they thought uh that they're now folding it into this justice league connected right. story to to maybe uh, well of course like you said he's he's working on justice league and so you know I, maybe it makes better sense to do it that way plus you know with everything um going on at dc comics now where just about or i guess the majority of things that they have are miniseries now instead of these uh, uh supposedly ongoing series um you know it's just a, it's a different time at dc comics i think yeah. right now yeah I mean, the pandemic had a lot to do with that. The That's super, true. Bendis' Superman stuff was, was, while it ended, you could sort of feel that it had to end be, for whatever reason. And a lot of that stuff got shifted to Justice League. So mm. uh, had if we didn't have the pandemic, you know, maybe some of this still would have been the narrative. Maybe some of this still would have been this way, but told in a different way. You yeah, know? That's, that's what I suspect, too. Yeah, so um, uh, so we'll have to see. We'll have to see. I mean, um, um, once that comes out, you know, because we've we had the original Great Darkness saga, we had the you know spiritual sequel in the five years later. Um, during the Abnett and Lanning run, there was a you know a multi-part story with Dark Side that I don't remember if I read but it's not quite great darkness but you could tell it's meant to flavor that you know or it might have been called the great darkness and I just don't remember you know um hardcore legion fans are yelling at me right now um so we've touched on Dark Side versus the legion a few times you know so it'll be interesting to see you know, maybe that's something we'll do for our project. You know, we actually talked about looking at the Great Darkness Saga at some point or another, um, which is the whole reason why we created the Tales part of our project, you know, so that we could do these little spin-off things. So maybe there's a, maybe we'll be getting to the Great Darkness Saga earlier than we thought <laughs> if we want to like do it as like a precursor to mm -hmm. Bendis' version. Yeah. But that yeah. sounds like it'll be for, it won't be for a while. So, uh, we do have some feedback. I'm going to save it for the end just to make sure we have, we get through what we need to get through here, uh, for the rest, for the meat of our episode. One of the feedback I will talk about when we actually talk about, um, the cover to this issue. So I'd say we jump into Legion of Superheroes issue number 32. All righty. Let's, let's do it. Uh, yeah, chapter one, as I said, this is, uh, first of a four-part story a saga i believe was the word that was used at some point somewhere that i read uh forgotten heroes is the title uh written by paul levitz greg laroque pencils mike de carlo inks john costanza letters carl gafford colors with arn star returning for an inking assist karen berger as editor and of course a lovely cover by steve lytle in this issue, Saturn Girl awakens in an unfamiliar place and quickly discovers the other people with her are mind-controlled, including teammate Dream Girl. On Earth, Science Police Officer Aaron directs another officer to remove the emblem. She then posts a notice declaring the Legion headquarters is closed permanently. After toiling in the fields for the day, Saturn Girl discovers Chameleon Boy and Brainiac 5. She later contemplates her discovery of others like her, uh, such as Gas Girl, uh, a Green Lantern, and other science police officers, and then goes for a dip in the water fountain. Glub, glub. Ambassador Relnick is, in all, is all a Twitter now that, he, uh, now that he and the Legionnaires have crossed over into Dominator space. Monel offers to fly ahead, but Relnick prefers he stay close. Then Dominator warships appear. 
Saturn Girl's night swim was for naught because she could not find the fountain source. A spy drone then follows her around, offering encouragement when she strays from her assigned tasks. That night, she resolves to rest and work out her new escape plan, which includes returning to, quote, burn this damn planet down around the ears of whoever put me here. The Legionnaires on Hycraeus arrive at the area of Atmos's last reported sighting, and they are being watched by Zamir. It's the following night, and Saturn Girl puts her new plan into motion. She nerve pinches Dream Girl into unconsciousness and carries her to a nearby rock outcropping where Saturn Girl has also deposited the comatose Chameleon Boy and Brainiac 5. Whew. After arrest, Saturn Girl contemplates her next move to free her comrades' minds. In the Presidential Palace, Universal gloats how his plan, quote, has all come together so perfectly after so long. Despite his needing to kill his own son to accomplish it at all, Santa Girl delves into Dream Girl's mind and frees her from the ment uh, mental brainwashing, and she does the same uh, to Brainiac 5 and Chameleon Boy. She is about to explain everything to them, telling them, quote, together we're getting off this damn prison world. Excellent. Good recap. I enjoyed that. <laughs> There's some weird, uh, slight oddities to this whole thing, but no, uh, we may we may get into those. But <laughs> that I was I was kind of uh, riffing off of there. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, so it is chapter one. Um, let's let's talk about the cover first. <clears throat> then we'll go into our larger thoughts. Let's, let's tease the audience a little bit. All right. So we only have one cover. <laughs> one cover only. No reprint. No collection. This has never been collected, as far as I know. Steve Lytle. Uh, a particular branding, if not necessarily, there's no like uh, the Universal Project itself is just regular font, but we have this banner going vertically uh, along the cover. Chapter one, big number one, right? For anybody walking in, ooh, is that a first issue? Ooh, let me look, right? You know, <laughs> branding, branding. And then we have uh, uh, the lone figure of Saturn Girl, and then in the background, um, I love this cover. I love the demand, dismantling of the Legion headquarters. There's something very creepy about it. The, the headquarters doesn't often get its own spotlight on a cover. How cool yeah. is that? Right. Yeah. Um, and you look at it and you go, wait, what is this? What's happening? Are they getting attacked? Are they, what, what, why is that happening? That's, I need to find out what's going on. Yeah. It's, it's just enough to tickle your fancy and maybe get you to buy the, the issue. Right. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I like the cover. I like, I like the, the, the you know, it's not, it's Legion focused, but not really. And, you know, um, when we get through all four covers, we'll have to see which one was our favorite. So, <laughs> uh, so what do you what uh, what are the thoughts or what do you think of the cover? Well, uh, let me start by saying uh, I re I distinctly remember going through uh, uh, back issues when when I decided that yeah I was gonna because uh, I, I think I talk about this just about every <laughs> every episode now, but uh, there was a time when I did not I was not getting uh, this uh these legion issues month to month when they were being published right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so i had decided in in in, in the future of that past <laughs> to finally go back and get these back issues and i i distinctly remember going through thumbing through the uh a long box at, at the comic book shop where i lived in the town where i lived and coming across i think it was this one i think it was chapter one and seeing that cover seeing the chapter one seeing saturn girl on here and I'm like, oh, this is going to be awesome just because of the cover, right? And I also remember that I think I did not, I was not able to get all four. They didn't have all four issues. So I had to wait for one of them. I forget which one now, but, um, but yeah, I, like you, it's like, you know, this is a, this is a very distinctive cover with that, with that banner. I love that. Um, uh, the, the fact that they're, they're spotlighting a character and the issue emulates that in, in in that Saturn girl is the the main focus of the plot good point and so uh I, I probably unlike Peter I have not read the other three parts to the story yet I am I am coming at it new fresh uh everything is unknown to me at this point um the details of or I should say are unknown to me and so I am very curious if and I'm very 
anxious to find out if in the next issue, whomever is on the co- uh, uh, being spotlighted on the cover here, um, uh, is is the story going to focus on them like Saturn Girl was focused on? Mm-hmm. Uh, I kind of doubt that's going to be the case in the in the four issues that we get because you know she's she's getting uh, her other. Uh, uh, trapped legionnaires together. And so it becomes more of a group effort, uh, plus everything else that's going on uh, involving the legionnaires, you know, the larger group of legionnaires. So, but, but I like the idea of that. And so I, I kind of hope that Paul Levitz and, and the others kind of pull that off to some degree, even, even if it's not to the, to the degree that we get here. Right. Um, uh, I, I lo- like you, I love the, 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 the legion headquarters on this, but I, I want to say Lytle's headquarters here uh is so it looks so dynamic it's it it, it's much rounder more three-dimensional looking than any other uh artist that we've seen i think do this version of the legion headquarters anywhere yeah and i i it just makes again makes me uh, miss lytle's design sense so much yeah yeah, because even in the issue, LaRoque is very kind of two-dimensional when it comes to buildings and perspective. Um, the only one I could maybe think is when Giffen first designed it and first drew it in mm. one of those Legion issues and the newsstand issues, you know. Um, but I, but I, I do. I the the notion that the headquarters had in my has in my brain is because of dialogue in that first appearance of it where everybody said they were like, my God, it's gigantic. And since then, some, some people don't draw it like that. They kind of still keep it within the, you know, perspective of like the orange headquarters, which just sort of fit within that plaza. But the notion is, is that it is supposed to be huge and unexplored in many ways, you know, like I know there was a map, but everybody always talked about, getting lost or there's there's dialogue about getting lost or that it's such a big headquarters things don't work right doors don't open every now and then and um i feel like that was a story that either levitz wanted to get to in his very long list of to do Mm. or he said i'm just going to make it a fun part of the thing that this headquarters does this but it does it's not consistent which is unfortunate it's something in my notes as we read that i'm keeping watch on but it but it's very inconsistent so plus as we talked we mentioned before the top part of it is meant to be a ship right when you look at Mm -hmm. one of the maps and the schematics the whole thing is supposed to lift off and be a ship so yeah i'm a fan of this headquarters i loved when it showed up back again at convergence you know when you briefly saw at least on the cover you know so um uh, I mentioned that we had some feedback that might relate to the cover. Um, this was in um, one of our previous conversations for Legion of uh, t- the Legion Project episode thirty. Jerry McMullen on Twitter, who runs the EssentialShowcase.com site and talks about essentials and showcases and collected editions, and you can go check that out. Um, said on Twitter. Catching up today on this episode, episode 30, you mentioned the branding of the story on the cover. Um, I'm assuming we were talking about Universo Project, but maybe we were talking about issue 30. I don't know. Um, A la the Judas contract from New Teen Titans in 1984. Jerry said, first one I recall, because we were talking about like this wasn't a thing back then. Branding covers to make a match. It wasn't a thing. Uh, Jerry says, first one I recall is Crisis on Earth Prime, the Mm. JLA, JSA, All-Star Squadron crossover from 1982. Very simple branding, but all five covers had the same design where the, you had the floating heads around the border and then the Mm -hmm. inset image and then across the top Crisis on Earth Prime. And uh, I immediately, you know, I said on Twitter, I was like, oh my God, how could I not... (laughs) <laughs> right, <laughs> right. I could I not, you know, part. Some of those covers were by George Perez, if not yeah. all of them, uh, or at least the Justice League ones. Um, and I did write. I guess I took it for granted because the floating head thing is such a, such a thing. It is a thing in Justice League. Well, Legion Justice Two. Covers. Yeah. And then that made me remember Wonder Woman two ninety one, two ninety two, and two ninety three. All right. 
the judgment story from a few months before the crisis on Earth Prime. So there's another DC story, three-parter, that had a, uh, a cover branding to it, you know, that you picked up all three issues and they all look the same. It's the Book of Judgment and I think Destiny is involved in that. And, um, uh, and there might be more. There might be more that I'm just not thinking of, you know. Yeah, but now I want now I want to go go look at all those covers from around that time to see right what what else did we miss? Yeah, wow. And the Legion certainly has had covers, right? The think of any time they do covers where they have like you know blocks of characters you know around, and then there's like one main character in the middle. They've done that mm -hmm. a few times. Mm -hmm. Um, but in terms of branding, I, I assume this is the first one to to focus on a particular story, you know. Um, so at least in terms of Legion title, I think this is the first one. Um, so I wanted to give that little shout out there for for Jerry, Jerry and Colin. Thank you, Jerry. Let's get to it. Eric, <laughs> what did you think of the first chapter? of the universal project. The, so, the story that our podcast is, that our baby is named after. So you, <laughs> you better like it. No. Go ahead. Oh yeah. See that, that is the problem. I was just like, uh, I, I don't, I don't want to be, I, no. I, I, it's not negative, but yeah. it's just like this, this, this is how the universal project proper starts out. It's <gasps> so slow. Um, it's such a slow beginning to it. It's, uh, maybe it's, maybe it's a slow burn, you know, that they're, but we only have four issues of this. Um, and, and like I said, I don't, I don't recall where I heard that it was referred to as a saga or, or was it in that, in that, that text? Yeah. 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 Here it is. Yeah. And I, I read it, it, you know, from, from the, the issue blurb uh, from that time, you know, the first of a four issue saga. And I read this, I'm like, this this is a saga <laughs> but you know i but despite that it's a very minor nitpick you know it is uh, uh i what i really liked about this issue um besides the cover uh was uh the latter part of the issue where saturn girl gets into the minds of her, of her fellow three legionnaires that are trapped on this world. And mm -hmm. that is where it's like, Oh my God, this is, this is such a cool idea. Uh, why didn't they ever do something like this before? Do, do we get to see this later? You know, just, I just, all these neurons were firing based on those images, but that has really nothing to do with, with the universal project as a whole, right? It's just an incidental part of it. So again, I, you know, I just come back to, this is how they started. But I will, I will add, this is not the start of the Universal Project because this has been brewing since at least issue 10. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I figured you would correct me if, if I got that wrong. Uh, because that's the issue that we first saw Vid Gupta, who was the, the, uh, the aide to uh, President Desai, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. And and then we find I forget what issue it was that we find out that Vid Gupta is is Universo. Oh, it may it have been that issue. I thought was it that issue? Okay, it, like you saw the little glint, and he's now the vice president. Yeah, because that was oh, the yeah. election issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. If there so... was anything prior to that, I don't remember. But I do. But that was like, yeah, we all at issue ten. I'm sure if you go back to episode ten we already were talking about, oh, mm -hmm. there it is, seeds for the Universo project. Yeah, exactly. So um, so that's that's cool. So we, now we get uh, 20, what, 22, yeah, 22 issues later, uh, almost two years later in publishing history, we, we get this, uh, the next chapter, uh, or maybe even the, uh, the, the defining chapter of what this whole thing has been brewing over all this time, uh, what that's going to be. Right. And, and so, uh, and then you had to go and ruin it by, uh, directing me to, uh, adventure comics, 359 and 360. <laughs> well, that's because Paul Levitt we, said, yeah, that's true. That's he true. said this story is based on that story. Right. Right. And, and where I, I forget where, where did he say that? Was that in the letter column somewhere? Yeah. One of the letter columns. I can quick look it up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I had missed, I had either missed it or forgotten that detail until you brought it up. 
uh, in our discussion of this particular episode. And then I went and read that. I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know if we want to get into that now, but uh, I, I have thoughts about that too. <laughs> Let me uh, follow up with those thoughts and say, yeah, there were a couple, I thought there were a couple um, oddities about this issue. Um, my one of my questions is consider it concerns the timeline. So we at the end of issue 31, everybody fell asleep at the end of that Jackie story because she was so bored or she was so boring and invisible kid fell asleep. Right. But the whole world, everybody fell asleep. The world sleeps, it says. OK. And. Saturn girl wakes up and it feels like she even questions how long have I been under? Mm hmm. But then we get these side stories, which we've been getting since issue 30 um, about the Legionnaires that are going to Telus' home world in search of Atmos and maybe in search of some clues to science police officers that have disappeared. And this whole notion of some science police officers being brainwashed goes all the way back to like issue 15. 14, 15, 16, somewhere around there. And then we have another group of Legionnaires heading off to the Dominator's world, as you mentioned, the Dominator's territory. None of them are under the, the influence. Um, and my notion was, how long, <laughs> how long have they been away if Saturn Girl has been under this, she assumes, for a number of days, right? Hmm. Or maybe that assumption is wrong. I don't know. Yeah. So the, the and I, I answered my own question because um, this story was supposed to take place in issue 31. It was solicited in some of the Legion issues prior to this as the Universal Project is going to start in issue 31. And then as we got closer, they said, OK, we we actually have to hold off for some reason. That's why we got that flashback story last episode. And then we got here. So really the timeline then, if, if you subtract one issue, it's not as terrible. Um, so the timeline is, oh, I'm sorry, we go back to issue 29. On 29 is when, issue 29 is when Element Lad was like, all right, Monel, Ultra Boy, Block, you have to go with Ambassador Relnick. You other people go to Hycraeus, right? Issue 30 is when they actually all left planet Earth and the quartet arrived on Hycraeus, White Witch, Wildfire, Quizlet, and Telus. Okay. In 31, there was no mention of any of that, or at least we didn't see it. There might have been a mention, but we didn't see it because that was that fill in issue. So I had to go, all right, it's been since issue 29, but I guess it wouldn't have been that long had we started in issue 31. But those those kind of felt weird. Like, that's what I want to, I don't remember what the answer is to that is. Why why aren't mon and Ultra Boy under the influence yet? I guess the easy answer is they're not on Earth. But we haven't seen anybody on Earth. We haven't seen any Legionnaires. That I thought was really curious, right? Yeah, that's true. Um, same thing with... Hycraeus. Now there are people on those in those locations that are under the sway of Universo, Ambassador Relnick, Talus's friend, random his random friend, and then we get this random appearance of Zamir. I was like, what? You know, <laughs> that's odd. So those those things were a little off putting. They they they're like a little unsettling. I was like, what? I don't get that. Um, but all the other stuff I agree with. I actually liked the. Somebody said in one of the letter columns, like, you know, the in, in media arrest, like just throwing us right into the Saturn girl predicament and this mm -hmm. strange alien world. And, and it's kind of like somebody said, did I miss an issue? Um, so what you call the slow burn, um, what you said about the cover, that it's a Saturn girl focused cover and it's a Saturn girl focused issue made me think how, and I have to, I have to be careful because I'm 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 using some hindsight here. The eye for the eye for an eye storyline was about the Legion of Superheroes and Le Legion of Supervillains. Ultimately, though, it became about a story about like Princess Projector or 
Karate Kid or really Lightning Lass, mm-hmm. right? Then we get the whole who is Sensor Girl mystery story about Sensor Girl and Projector, right? Is this story and the reason why we slowly focused on Saturn Girl going to be a story about Saturn Girl? All four issues, not just this issue, but the entire thing. I'm talking in hindsight because I know the answer to that, <laughs> um, <laughs> which I don't want to, you know, I'm sure you're, you know, you're smart enough to figure it out too, but you know what I mean? So I think that's why he took the time to really play with her, this issue. And I agree. I loved those mindscape uh, pages. I thought they were really cool. And I learned some things about Saturn girl in this issue that um, were kind of fun. Yeah, I, I, I apologize. I, I, I did. I, uh, I totally agree with you. I, I enjoyed this examination of the predicament through Saturn Girl's eyes. I really did. It was just, you know, uh, coming into a, a, a bannered story. It's referred to as a saga. That's really what I was kind of sure, sure, um, sure, sure. bouncing off of. But yeah, I, I totally enjoyed seeing uh, Saturn Girl be the focus of the story being having it be so uh, in a sense, intimate with her. Yeah. Um, and she's the other, and I think you, you've brought this up and maybe because you knew this was coming uh, uh, in previous episodes where um, uh, uh, we, 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 we might get, or we should get uh, a Saturn girl focus, you know, a, a Levitz focused examination of that character, like we've gotten with lightning lass and, and projectra and other some other characters along the way um so yeah i i if this is really a a saturn girl story and she's the you know the, the quote-unquote hero of the story which uh, that seems very very likely given the situation here which now i since i haven't reread all those universal related uh uh uh, past issues now i'm wondering did did has saturn girl and universal really went toe to toe in the uh, you know in, in in legion history uh and if not obviously this could very well be that the culmination right. of right. of all those encounters uh, in the past so yeah now now i'm now i'm very excited <laughs> as to what is what is to come yeah and I, I don't remember the next chapters i i, I remember remember some big beats but i don't remember the I don't remember it the way we're going to talk about it. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm also very curious to, to see if some of those things play out. Um, I read a bunch of, I've read a bunch more of those universal appearances and I don't think we ever really got a direct confrontation unless I, unless I can't remember because <laughs> I read them, you know, I didn't read them with the same eye that I did this issue. I just sort of read them really quickly, just sort of read them, you know, the brave and the bold issue with Batman and the Legion of superheroes was Saturn girl involved in that. I don't even remember. And I just read it like in the last week. Um, The thing that frustrated me was as she's floating around in this new war, she wakes up in this new world and she's, as she refers to them, the mindless ones or what, however she refers She's like, wow, they all have these blocks. Their minds are, are blank. I'm like, Saturn girl, come on. You've, first of all, you felt this before. <laughs> there has been a previous story where you're like, I can't sense their minds. I think it was either in, yeah, it was in Universal's very first appearance in issue 349 when they all go back to the different parts of the, of the past. And she's like, mm. hmm. I can't read this person's mind. It's blank. Why? You know, I'm like, okay, Saturn girl. In the very first appearance, you you should already go, I can't read their mind. Oh, Universal. Yeah. Like, that's it. Flat out done. <laughs> oh, I know who it is. So that part of it nudged me in a wrong way because I was like, come on, Levitz. Like, uh, you know. <laughs> well, you know, to, to to be fair, you know, she wakes up in this world. She doesn't know what's going on. And, and you know, she's more concerned about where she is and and how to get home but yeah i know I, it breaks down very quickly after that it's so quick it's this <laughs> as you mentioned either just recently or before we started recording it's the same story as 359 and 360 more or less right yeah yeah they come home 
the Legion are outlawed. They can't get in their headquarters. They wake basically, quote unquote, metaphorically, wake up to a new world, right? Mm, yes, yes. And everybody's whammy jammied around them and they don't have to, they don't understand it. So it's like Saturn Girl, again, she was involved in that story, but she was one of the Legionnaires that got sent to Tacron Galtos, right? So she wasn't mm -hmm. on Earth. But she is the one that figured it out in that story, but she couldn't tell the Earth Legionnaires because there was a barrier around Tacron Galtos, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So she was like, ah, if only I could tell them about the influence, but she couldn't. So she doesn't name Universo, but she clearly has figured it out. So I'm like, Saturn girl, I like your new haircut, but did it like zap out some brains? Like, come on. Come on. <laughs> Sorry, that's unfair. that's unfair. So, yeah, so there was those writer things that, that I was like, oh, Levitz, come on. Yeah, why is he even playing coy at this point? Because I don't know. it's very clear. I mean, it's, it's, it's on the cover. We, everybody now knows it's Universo and who's behind this. The only thing we don't know is how he did it. Right. How he accomplished some of these things. Right. Uh, so yeah, it's yeah, yeah. I I don't like it when when uh, when comic book writers play so coy like this. It's yeah. just it's just it's not very genuine. The only thing I could sort of think is that if with that with that huge issue number one on the cover, there's a new reader that's going that has no idea of anything. That's true. Mm -hmm. So for their benefit, he has to write it like that. So yeah, yeah. We can criticize, but I also understand it. You know. But it's that's still, true. I mean, we are we are still dealing with the era where sort of not really, but, uh, you know, every issue could be a, a reader's first issue type absolutely. mentality. And, and I, with go ahead. Oh, sorry, with with the Legion, you know, that's that's that problem is is uh, propagated, you know, or multiplied by, you know, 24 or whatever, because there's so many characters. Yeah. And if you're coming off of if you're a DC fan that's never read Legion and you're coming off of Judas Contract and Crisis and and Legends and you see that branding cover, that, it meant something to me. It meant something mm. to me as a mm -hmm. kid. I was like, oh, yay, they get a branded cover, you know, and suddenly all of a sudden, you know, titles everywhere started to do it. But it was such mm -hmm. a unique thing back then, you know, and and it caught my eye. So I have to imagine somebody's looking at that and going, oh yeah, pick that up. Let me read it. I have no idea. You know, and then we do get that page turn from page 19 to 20. And it's like, oh, oh, it's this guy. Okay. You know, so readers, you don't have to, new readers don't have to wait long to find out who's behind it. Yeah. So I was just going to ask you, so do you, do you feel like that, that given, given what we, what we just discussed, is this a successful first chapter to this, uh, what is an ongoing story? Compared to the issue, com just the four issues or compared to what we read prior? Or just the four issues? J well, just even just this first issue. This is if, first if, chapter. If this, if, this is, if this is the introduction, your introduction to the Legion. Oh, okay. It, is this a successful uh, introduction to the characters, to the plot, the situation, the universe? I think so. I, I think it, it's not as many legionnaires as it could be. Mm -hmm. You might be a little confused about some of the side stories. Why are they going to the Dominator's world? I don't know. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but you, what you get is an examination of Saturn Girl. You get in her head. She has a family. She she is going to fight for that family. She's already asking questions on, on as far as, you know, page eight. Why us? Why only us four? Right. And she says, I'm not even an active member anymore. When you get into the mindscape of those other three legionnaires, you're learning a hell of a lot about them. Personality wise, even some power wise, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and and just enough of the of the legion world around them to kind of make it fun oh it's the future but there's a green lantern in here there's a it's the future but there's another superhero from laulor you know like so there's a the sense of of a larger universe so yeah i think it i think it does work i think there might be some things they'll be confused about but but her story that pacing that you mentioned 
is it it's a lot right like it's the first nine pages the nine page first nine pages is just saturn girl so as a reader you're getting i have to imagine oh plus the whole page five with the headquarters you're getting a notion that something's not right and there's a mystery Mm -hmm. uh, and you know they need to figure it out we know who's behind it right away but as you mentioned what they're trying to figure out is how and why so yeah i guess it works i guess it works Mm -hmm. i would have to Maybe listeners, if you're completely new to the Legion or you've never read this before, it'd be really great if no, if they just were completely new to the Legion and right. just read this issue. <laughs> exactly. That would be amazing. <laughs> mm. I think I'll, I'll put that out on Twitter um, uh, after we're done recording here, Peter, nice. just to see if anybody, anybody fits that bill and, and maybe get some reactions yeah. to this. That would be awesome. And don't go in, don't go, don't go in reading it to be confused, read it like you would like you love comics right like what does it inspire you does it you know i'm sure you'll have, have questions but um you know i go in and i i immediately see things that don't mesh with what we talked about before but you know a new reader does should should just be able to read it and see what happens that's yeah. true i'm going to talk about the artwork a little bit right early this is early in our conversation but we, but i i liked the the artwork i think it um is is finished more than it has been in some previous like you can always tell when LaRoque is like okay he spent time on this issue versus versus this was a fast issue you know Mm -hmm. not to say that it's like one is terrible and one is better but there's some thought that seems to be behind this even if it's not as you know like the prisoners their their prison outfits or whatever they are they're, they're generic you know okay this the landscape they're on is kind of generic okay that field that is constantly ever present around them um uh but but you know there's there is stuff happening you know that on page 11 when we get the monel and ultra boy and all that there are panels but the whole background of the panels is just space you know it's kind of nice mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. it makes it a little little designy um the, the see, mo- the, this is where I think is this where Arn Star came in to do you know that or 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 on the prison planet you got that the, that uh, I guess that that force field that we see that crackling energy type barrier that we see in in all the backgrounds or maybe they're like hey Arn Star can you just ink page twenty seven when we get the Chameleon <laughs> Boys yeah right mindscape and all those little exactly swirls? exactly like just do that page please that'll save me five weeks um. Yeah, it's fine. I, again, read a review. People are like, I hate the art in this era. I'm like, okay, okay really? relax, relax. It's not that bad. <laughs> it's, it's just, they're holding, like I said, we, we talked about this enough. They're, they're holding on to an artist that hasn't been on since issue 23, you know, with Steve Lytle or mm-hmm. Keith Giffen, who hasn't been on since issue two, you know. And, and yes, you know, we get these great Steve Lytle covers, but you know, somebody else is doing the interior. I think it's fine. I think it's fine. And then we also get just, since we're talking about the art, we get the appearance of uh, Universo's outfit that appeared in Who's Who, which we discussed in a previous episode. Mm -hmm. I think it was last episode. Was it? Yeah. (laughs) That's how close they were with all that stuff, right? Yeah. See, I'd love that. That's, that's exactly it. It's great timing. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, uh, to, to give, you know, if you were, if you were, uh, getting the Legion book at that time and who's who, and, and uh, you see that Universo outfit and you're like, what, this is what I've never seen this before. And then, then here it is. Right. I, I love that. Uh, let's talk about the mindscapes. The, 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 oh, please. Yeah. Because that was, I think both of us agree that was, that was just a joy to read. Um, so Saturn girl gets her fellow legionnaires and they're all still under the whammy jammy. And she says, um, I'm going to do something that I, that, that as a rule, I swore that I wouldn't do since I was a little girl, I'm going to invade your mind without your consent. Um, these are special circumstances. I have to use, I have to get through these walls. Now we've seen Saturn girl kind of poke around in minds, right? Like with villains or, you know, surface thoughts, I guess, are one thing. Is that is that supposed to be the difference? 
I, yeah, I guess I, I, my, my recollection too, was that I think she's done this before, but maybe, maybe she's what was under some influence of something. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's hard to say, you know, with, with yeah. uh, the many decades of Legion history. Um, but you know, this, her, her declaring that, you know, that, that becomes like the, the, the new norm uh, right. for that character. Right. So, you right. know, just, we just kind of accept it. Plus, you know, in, in my history of reading the Legion from uh, the late 70, early 80s, something like that, um, I do recall that she was always hesitant to, to invade someone's mind. So, you know, that, that totally is in character uh, from, from my perspective. Cool. And maybe especially a Legionnaire of yeah. all things. Yeah. Yeah. So what were your, what were your notes or thoughts on, on, um, well, let's start with dream girl or how, or wherever you want to start. So I think the, the coolest thing about this, so we get two pages of, of dream girl, uh, her, uh, mindscape. Right. And, uh, at first, uh, Santa girl gets in there. And if, if you're paying attention to the images in the background, you see multiple, uh, images like with, uh, with star boy. Uh, we see, so let's see here. We see some nondescript characters, but then there there is a there is a star boy there. But there are three image, uh, at least uh, as far as I could tell, there are three images of him. And uh, and then and then we focus in on that uh, at the bottom of the page. And Santa Girls e- uh, even says, "Star boy, no, it's some sort of multiple image of him. Maybe that has to do with how Dream Girl's power works, how she sees people in future time." And I just thought, "Wow, that is." That is something we have, I don't think we have ever, ever uh, been told or have been shown about Dream Girl's ability. You know, it's, we, we normally just see her waking up from a dream and she's had a vision or, or something uh, is so, it's so momentous or, or powerful that it just kind of attacks her mind and, and she reacts to it. But we never get to actually see what she sees. Uh, it's always described. And, and seeing this, how a precog like dream girl actually sees people from her perspective. I just, that is so cool. And uh, so innovative, at least for uh, the, the Legion in Legion terms. I agree. I agree. And, and also that you see, if it is all star boy, you see him in his younger costume with the Cape. You see him in the Starfield costume and you even see White Witch way, way, way in the background, right? Which is her sister, Dream Girl's sister, up there with the antenna uh, to the right of that middle panel. Oh, see, I missed that. That's yeah. great. Okay, so you're you're the 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 caped character, the, the caped character on the right in that sequence. That is Starboy. Oh, well, now that I look at it, it looks like it has Monel's gold, yeah, circlets. Hmm. Maybe maybe. What? Maybe this is supposed to be like all the Legion. But but curious that if it is Monel, why Monel? Yeah. Or is it just, you know, could you even simplify it and say it's all the men in her life? Mm-hmm. Yeah. She is Dream Girl after all. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And I, I don't and I don't mean that in a callous way, you know, she's she's everybody's fancy or she's the fancy of everyone. I don't know. I, I just assume that was Starboy, but you're right. It maybe maybe it um I'd have to look at look up his costume, his old costume. See, this is the problem with uh reading these issues now with old eyes, Peter. I have uh, even with my glasses, I have a hard time focusing on <laughs> like like the drill uh, or white witch thing. I totally miss that and and now I'm looking at it going, or now I'm trying to examine the other characters in that sequence and try to say, do I recognize anybody else? Oh, wait, Starboy has those gold things too. Oh, that could be oh, him. That's, yeah, you're that's right. probably it, him. I, I guess it's the, the, the length of the cape through me because I remember his, his cape being a little shorter than this, but you know, artistic license. Sure. It, it is a dreamscape after all. And the notion that the blocks that are, are around her, as Saturn Girl says, from the Keeper, she has, Dream Girl has turned it into a giant gem, a giant crystal around yeah. her, just like, just to get into her ego, right? Yeah, what an ego. There are, there are the deep blocks, but she's twisted even that to be a jeweled cage. 
And again, I'm going to say Dream Girl is probably one of the more fascinating Legionnaires based on little tidbits of information that we're given, little, little, little mm -hmm. uh, drops of information like this. It's just, oh my God, I want, I want uh, more of a focus on this character. Yeah. And we have to remember that like in some of the backup tales that we read, or when we, when we get into stories about White Witch, she is from a world that is steeped in, in the supernatural, you could say, you know, whether it manifests, either it manifests as precog abilities, and they always use the word oracle, right? Isn't that a word that gets thrown around a lot on that planet? Oracle, A-U-R, like the oracles or whatever. Yeah. Uh, or O-R, or is that Orando? I'm trying, I might be mixing. Oh, it. yeah, I think it's Orando. Yeah. Um, but anyway, and then you got White Witch, who was all about mysticism because she went off into the sorcerer's world. So, uh, you know, the there is something to... I like that, that there's something more to Dream Girl than just her precog ability. She would be very aware and she would have maybe, even if it's underlying power, to be able to protect herself in a in a supernatural way, in a mystic way, whatever you want to think of. So I yeah, like that's that. A, yeah, that's a cool idea. Yeah, there's, there's again, I, I, I don't think there's a lot that we have really been shown about uh uh what wh uh, what's what's uh dream girl's home world nalor naltor naltor yeah um and and given i'm well you know we i think well we have white witch to go over in the who's who entry right the, mm -hmm. this time mm -hmm. so there's a little there's a little bit there but but uh yeah there's what what how do you on a world where most of the people, because that's how the Legionnaires <laughs> homeworlds are, most of the people, if not all of them, um, have this ability. And, and yet you are the premier person uh, with that ability. And, and so you come to the Legion and then you just become one of many powered people. And you kind of get, I think she's been given short shrift for many years. And you kind of get that, 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 uh, unique nature that you have kind of gets lost or, or smoothed over because there's, there's, there's altar boy there or, or, uh, uh, element lad, you know, things like that, where, uh, more char uh, characters who have maybe more, a little more interesting visually power sets or, or even just intellectually, like being able to turn one element into another. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, uh, what do you do? Oh, oh, I see the future when I sleep. Yeah. Well, that's not very, that's not very interesting <laughs> uh, in a, in a superhero comic book. So. But in this run, Levitz has really gone out of his way. We've been talking about her on and off. Every time she makes an appearance, we always talk about her. I mean, she is the standout. It's going to be really interesting to get to issue 63 and go, oh, this run is entirely about this character, this character, this character, and this character. And Dream Girl is in that list. Absolutely. So then we get to the Brainiac 5 Mindscape. I really liked this one as well. Um, yeah. The notion that his mind is so strong, she can't even project her mind in unless it's a pulse of energy. It has to almost yes. assimilate to what, the you know, how fast his mind is. And I like that she says there's so much power, so much energy he would break through himself in another few days, even without any training in mental powers. What a madhouse. Everything's happening so fast. So, and then to, to be um, artistically um, echoed, right? Like uh, LaRoque and company, they have to try to figure out what that means artistically. And we get a kind of like a culmination of that here on these pages, 24 and 25. Yeah, I love that that first image of of his head, which is uh, smooth green, the, 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 the blackened eyes, um, and then the circuitry as our, to, to provide some defining features of his face, right? That's what a great image to artistically show uh, how this character is uh, subconsciously, at least, self-portrayed. And it kind of, uh, I don't know if it reminded you, but it, it has a bit of a Parisian vibe to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I've seen uh, things like that. 
I can see that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but just, you know, it's, it, it, it evokes like this very cold, emotionless computer like aspect of him, which, you know, he's been talked about in those terms. Um, and, and depending on who's writing him at the time, sometimes he comes across that way, but for him, for his self image to be like this, right. That's really interesting to me because outwardly while he's reserved and, uh, you know, a bit of an intellectual snob at times, he does come across as quite personable, at least in this run of, of comics that we've been reading. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this is a, this is an interesting dichotomy between what, how he feels about himself, uh, like I said, perhaps only subconsciously, uh, and what we actually see, uh, how he interacts with others. So, right. and then you get, yeah, then, then the next page where you get, uh, uh, his, his nerve center, his brain center, I, you know, <laughs> with, with the circuitry and, and, uh, nerve endings just this 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 uh conglomeration of those things you know he is the computer brain uh of the legion so i this is really cool and you get to see what well, is that that's that's got to be jor-el right in in the lower left of this mass oh no um invisible kid oh i'm sorry yes that's yeah. i have I had that in my notes. Oh. I, I I did. I did. I I don't know why I went to Jorel uh, right there. Don't you but think yeah. that's interesting that he think that of all the legionnaires, it's Invisible Kid, right? Yes. Yes. And I think we talked about maybe in a previous episode where we were saying were they really that close of friends? And you you know you sort of said well, it's probably more of an extrapolation of the idea of two very brainy scientists yes. would strike up a friendship. Um, and, and here it is, you know, like there's, it probably was during Invisible Kid 2's journey through his wonky powers, whenever mm. Brainiac was researching him, you know, but to see him there, that, that he resonates that strongly, um, in mm -hmm. Brainiac 5's mind, my God, you could go, you could take that 20 different ways, you know, I thought that was very <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> Who's the and woman supposed to be? That's got to be Supergirl, right? I thought so. She kind of looks like Dream Girl, but I was like, well, I I was gonna I was gonna suggest, you know, she that doesn't have the star, the star, right? Yeah. yeah, that's the only that's the only thing where it's like, yeah, that could be Dream Girl. Oh, uh, could it be Jackie? Because that has been oh, sort of on his mind, even true. as far as the one of the previous issues. That is, yeah, very true. Who also that has would, that would hair. totally make sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then who's the general? Is that supposed to be like his father or something? The 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 guy down below in the gown. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't sure on that. That's I guess that's how I took that too. Yeah. So for for a computer brain like this, uh, it's it's curious that uh, you know, artistically we're not quite sure who some of these characters are supposed to be. Which is kind of fun, which is also kind of because, you know, sure. that, that would be the struggle. That's Brainiac's struggle, right? That's true. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I, the only, despite the fact that this is a very busy looking page with mm -hmm. everything that's going on in the background of it, um, I would have, I think I would have much preferred even more, even more of these uh, bubbles of characters because you would, I, I, I imagine Brainiac 5 is constantly thinking about, a hundred different things at once. Sure, sure. And and while this is sort of depicting that, I I think they could have went even further with with that notion. And then in contrast, we get to Chameleon Boy, where visually, I, th I think the 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 dialogue is is more interesting than the visual. But um, you Agreed. know, for their what? Yeah, for their attempt to try to figure out what it would be like in chameleon boy's brain that's not a you know it's not a bad attempt there would be different options obviously but it's not a bad attempt yeah i i, I took this to be a little more uh this is he, he, chameleon boy would see things more on a cellular level and mm. I, I maybe that's what they're going for here that's great um uh, and, you know uh saturn girl says here where how Derlin see the world with no fixed shape. Their, their perceptions must be so different from our human ones. Um, uh, you know, 
what I would like, I guess what I would have liked is, and I guess we kind of get to see that. Like I said, it, it looks like a, a collection of cells and they're kind of moving around each other and swirling around and stuff. I just, maybe, maybe a little more movement shown to show that shifting nature, different shapes, not just these uh, oddly uh, circular-esque type uh, distinct uh, globs, I guess. I don't right. know. <laughs> like maybe because she visually says, like you mentioned, um, how they perceive things, right? Uh, can I see through Cam's senses while I'm in here or, or only see the abstractions that form his self-images? It might have been cool to see the other Legionnaires around him, right? Like I'm pulling in knowledge from later Legion stories where the antenna are used to kind of mm -hmm. scope out the world around, right? So it would have been interesting to see Saturn Girl, Brainiac 5, Dream Girl as abstractions. Yeah. You know, because they're the immediate thing, right? They're they're immediately yep. in, in, in his environment. But I do love the notion of the cellular thing because I did not get that. And you have to imagine that, first of all, that's not even Chameleon Boy's real image, the one that we see, right? Durlins mm -hmm. don't look like that. They look, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, melty insectoids in <laughs> in robes you know they look weird right we don't ever really get a sense of who, what they look like so so i like the the fluid nature i you know they're just like his body is probably constant constantly in motion because it's, it's he's a shapeshifter so it's almost like odo from deep space nine so. <laughs> yeah there you go yeah that's true uh Camille boy did precede odo by by uh, a few decades so mm -hmm. A decade, a decade and a half. Anyway, but we do get to see him, uh, Chameleon Boy, here trapped in this um, literal mental block, a block shape. So that's that's what I guess, or at least the way I took it. This this was the intention of of Universo. This this was how these characters' psyches would be imprisoned within their own minds. Um, and we uh, obviously, Dream Girl has such a th th such an ego that it's not like that. And Brain Egg Fives is completely different from that. So interesting that Chameleon Boy uh, has succumbed to the mental block in this in in this fashion, at least uh, perhaps uh, as intended, is is what I'm trying to say. Like a bug in amber. Ooh, but that that would have fit perhaps even better with the way that uh, Dream Girl's prison is shown. Mm. Some or or something like that. Yeah, yeah. That 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 would have been great. Yeah, they were great. I think that I think this whole sequence speaks really well to Levitz, to LaRoque, to the entire company to be able to take that opportunity to do that in a way that has never that hasn't really been done in other Universal stories. Right. Um, it's all just been about his pendant controlling people, even Superboy, because it's got a little kryptonite dust in those early stories because kryptonite was everywhere. And but we didn't really get what the struggles were uh, inside the mind. So, yeah. you know, here yeah. Levitz is actually giving us that. So great, great. Re you know, it is called the Universo Project after all. So we should be learning <laughs> not only about the heroes, but the villain itself. So, Well, okay. So since since you, that's a great segue, right, to maybe go into that two page, two pages of, of Universo here. Okay. Um, him, like I said uh, before, he, you know, he's just kind of gloating, monologuing. <laughs> As as villains want to do, yeah, uh, you know, and he declares Earth is my. So wait, um, it has taken the building of entire worlds. So that's the prison planet uh, to suit my purposes. But I have succeeded. The Legion has finally been destroyed beyond repair. Well, that may be a little celebrating a little too early there. Sure, uh, we uh, haven't Mr. even Bidar. seen the entire Legion yet. Like how how is he? <laughs> you know. <laughs> I don't even get the sense that that's supposed to make me feel like the other ones are dead or, you know what I mean? Like I just, I just, I was, I said the same thing. I was like, slow your roll there. Universe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. His hubris is constantly his downfall, which of course that's, that's a, it's a, a longstanding uh, villain trope. Yeah. Uh, but, but he does say that, and the earth is mine. But then we get, and this is, I don't know, at least this, uh, maybe the last issue. Uh, he, he said the same thing. 
but you know he talks about how uh, uh, I'll not be beaten by the one man who has always let the legion stand in my way, his son, even though it took killing my own son, the earth is mine, and he and he crushes the globe that that uh, holds Ron Vidar's image, you know that his uh, hollow globe or whatever. Um, uh, you know, I have been reading Universo's declarations uh, about his son, about having to kill his own son, as this is this is eating him up, and the the only way he can cope with it is to make these uh, 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 angry declarations uh, like this. Uh, I had to kill you to achieve my goal, um, even though I didn't want to. That's the that's the subtext here. So I, I, that is to, to your earlier point, I think that is where I hope that Levitz and company are, are moving Universo towards that. He has to deal with this. Um, uh, what, what's the, what's the term when you murder your own children? In, infant, <laughs> infant, infanticide. Infanticide. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Just what, what is he, what is he, and, and is that the key to his downfall for his control over all this, the situation? Yeah. Right. Right. And, and we have to remember that Ron Vidar's death happened off panel. Mm-hmm. We were just told at the end of Brainy's lucky day that he was dead and then Brainy collapses, but we weren't actually shown anything. So this might be a good time to lightly go back into some of those back issues for Universo as we've read, you know, whichever ones we read. <laughs> because he's such, first of all, he is such an ineffectual villain. My God. <laughs> Every story, what, what were you going to say? Well, I was. aren't they all, though, in the, in, in the, all, in the Legion? But, but he's just, <laughs> his stories are so he, formulaic. Yeah, he keeps hitting the same beats, doesn't he? Yeah, it's like, <laughs> I'm going to... First of all, he either wants to take over the United Planets, the Council, the Earth, the world. That's the same thing he wants to do here. He's doing it the same way by becoming... Um, so in that two-parter in Adventure Comics 359 and 360, he does the same thing. He's vice president. He kills the president to become the president. And then while he's masquerading as a different person, outlaws the Legion shuts them down, doesn't let them run around in their power or using their powers, their costumes, right? Uh, comes up with a plan to to spread a water purification plant or, or you know, technology all throughout the world because that's how he's going to control everybody through water. So first of all, we get to Saturn Girl's prison planet and she also has to like think about, oh, this planet has sulfur as water. Oh, but we have this fountain here. Hmm, let me go see what the origin is. I was like, if it has to do with water again? <laughs> okay. So so he he walks in. He wants to try to control. He combats the Legion. He usually always has to have some kind of technology. Um, There's a Brave and the Bold story with Batman where, you know, they're fighting him. And they're, again, he's like making deals with a robot. And there's like an mm-hmm. egg thing, right? There's a Superman family story where he goes back in time to to try to get a device from Argo City and he gets wrapped up with Supergirl and he's going to come and use that device to to destroy the Legion to take. It's like he can't just rely on himself because the hypnotic stuff is not enough. Right. Maybe so that, maybe maybe sorry maybe it's a, a throwback to the fact that you know we we just we recently just recently discovered in publication time um that he is uh, a or potentially a former green lantern and oh. so maybe he's all constantly chasing that damn ring that's true you would think in because of that story that he would want something more cosmic bigger mm-hmm. grander you know oh, yeah he, yeah he was trying to find out the origin or he was quickly seduced into the story of, oh, you know, they were trying to figure out the origin. Well, let me try to figure out the origin, you know, and it's like, okay, so it, no, but it just turned around to power, right? Or just control or ruling. Then there's this weird, uh, okay, so then we got to throw Ron Vidar in it. Okay. In the very first story, in the very first appearance in 349, 
where the legionnaires are they're going to be judges to a science fair and they meet that kid and he's like oh i invented the time cube because i'm a brilliant you know whatever um and then by the end of that story even though he's not named we find out that this kid is universo's son and and the kid helped to def- defeat him by saving the legion th- in time and blah 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 right and then universo in that story is like oh no not him right then he gets carted off to jail and Rond is like depressed, right? It ends on that panel of him just like, oh, I just did this to my, why is my father so evil? <laughs> um, first of all, uh, let me, or let me sidestep. And clearly Rond Vidar is a flesh fiction suit for Jim Shooter because in that letter column, they say, oh yeah, this story was written by 14 year old Jim Shooter, James Shooter, who also just won a science fair project in his hometown of Pennsylvania. And I was like, oh, Ron Vitter, it's Jim Shooter. He's sticking himself in those stories. Right, what you know. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Well, then it kind of was like, what was going on with his dad? Right? Right? (laughs) So then the the two-parter then that this story is based on was the, that's where you got the notion where Universo is holding Rond in prison, right? Or holding him back and saying, I'm doing this for you. I'm, I want to control the world for, for, for my son, right? I was like, oh, well, this, okay, that's a little bit of a switch, right? Like that, that he's doing all this because he, you know, wants to, he calls him uh, the heir to his power. Which I was like, whoa, okay, here's this, this is a whole new notion to um, what do you want of me, son? I've conquered a world, a universe for you. I don't want to keep you confined, confined here, but I can't chance you're ruining my life's dream. Um, uh, you know, we, we are uh, immune to the influence. Um, speak, my son, heir to my power. I was like, okay, so now he's now we're supposed to get the notion that he's doing this for Ron, but then later stories he's like, no, get that punk out of here again. So he's he's very kind of back and forth with that. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I guess I could I could I could read this as um, uh, he knows Ron is a weakness. He even said he even calls him a weakling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in this in this sequence, but you know, uh, he how for whatever reason Ron has this immunity to his own in uh, his father's own influence. So he's always, Ron is constantly going to be a potential monkey wrench in his plans. So Mm -hmm. is this just him trying to win over his son by, 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 by claiming he's doing it uh, for him Um, or, or yeah, or is, is it, he's just, the universe. is just this weird schizophrenic villain who doesn't know what he wants from one uh, appearance to the next. Right, right. And I, I didn't talk about like Superboy and Legion 207, which is the first appearance of science police officer Devron, who also gets caught up in a whole Universo thing. Um, uh, and Universo was, wasn't really, I mean, he was the villain, but he wasn't, the, the, the point was really about Devron himself. Um, and then he's made other appearances, small appearances here and there. So he's not, yeah, he's been inconsistent. I th- He's Let me put it this way. He's been consistent in that he wants to control and is not the smart, doesn't go about it in the smartest ways. (laughs) Although the two-parter, I mean, he did, you know, whammy jammy the entire earth. And I liked when, when the Legion landed in that two-parter and uh, science police and other people, they started decon, they started um, tearing down the cruisers because it made me think of the cover. Right. Where they tore, tearing down the Legion headquarters and in the one page where they're, you know, ripping off the L emblem and everything. I was like, oh, that's a nice callback, you know, to that story. And totally, literally and figuratively, figuratively and literally dismantling the Legion, you know. Um, so uh, there were a lot of callbacks to that story. The, the other callback that I really liked, and I have a, um, I have a new thought about callbacks um that i'll talk to talk about in a second okay because because my whole after reading those two issues the adventure comics issues yeah and and uh realizing that we're basically 
it's the same story being retold with, with some different dressing, set yeah. dressing, yeah. right? Why? Why would Levitz do this? Uh, I got a point. I, got, okay. I, 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 I can answer that. <laughs> Let me talk about one other thing, though. The okay. ending where they're all like, okay, we're going to do this. And Saturn Girl's like, listen to my mind carefully. I'll tell you the trouble. I swear to you, I've gotten this far. Together, we're getting off this planet, as you mentioned. They're all holding hands, right? At the end of the first chapter of that two-parter, the Legionnaires are underground. They're like, we have to fight the law. So if we're fighting the law, that means we need to be renegades. So we need to, they even call it like a pact or something like that. Um, where's that issue? Where's my comic? I just lost it. Here it is. Okay. So at the end of part one, they do the same thing. They, 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 they put all hands in, right? The Legion has never defied the law before, but now it's the law that's turned against us. We must stick together and get whoever's behind this. Invisible Kid says, and I propose a pact before this, right? We will operate secretly as a resistance resistance movement. The Legion goes underground starting now, and they're all hands in, right? The last panel. That's the mm -hmm. same thing they're doing here, right? All right, hands in. Right. And uh, we're going to do this. Love that. I love that callback, which you don't get unless you read those two issues right before it, which we both did, right? So I love that. Um, and and meanwhile, those those that two parter, the first story was it was okay. I thought the second part was really a lot better. It was much more energy in it. They're doing things. They're being renegades. They're going after this and trying to fix breaking people out of prison and. I was like, okay, that's pretty cool, you know, for a 14 year old who wrote it, 15 year old, whatever he was. Uh, oh, wait, was it Jim Shooter? Yeah, it was Jim Shooter. Um, uh, as a kid reading it, you get to see the Legionnaires battling everybody and using their powers. And it's like, okay, that's pretty cool, you know? So I did like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. It kind of speaks to what you said about slow burn versus action. Like the first chapter was slow burn, the second chapter was all action. So, sure. Okay. Why is Paul Levitz doing this? Because because he loves those old adventure comics issues. <clears throat> maybe, maybe <laughs> so much that he he's going to replicate them. <laughs> Let me get my notes here. <laughs> <clears throat> In this Legion volume, this Baxter run, we've had the Legion of superheroes versus Legion of supervillains. We've had that story before. Nemesis Kid, Karate Kid. Paul Levitz talked about answering the question of their very first appearance, right? The, 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 the two-parter. He's like going back to that again. He made specific reference to that. Lightning Lad, the, or, or the Lightning sim, siblings fighting each other. We had in this volume, Lightning Lass and Lord fighting. In the previous volume, we had Lord and Lad fought, fighting, right? There was a whole issue devoted to that. When we read the issue with the five new Legion members uh, captured by Regulus and Regulus fighting Sunboy, you made reference that that's, that was an issue Levitz wrote, you know, around issue 300, whenever that was, you know, like, again, sort of repeating that battle. Okay. Mm -hmm. Infinite Man. Paul Levitz does an issue of Infinite Man to kind of tell maybe put a well first of all to use it for the crisis but maybe to follow up on the previous story but it kind of had the same beats yeah he used the sclarian pirates that female pirate group which he also used in one of his first which i think was the infinite man issue um which was one of levitt's earliest issues mm -hmm. touching on a new star finger Pretty much ending the story for Validus and Mordru, right? He's kind of taken them off the, the map because Validus is now, there is no more Validus. And Mordru is, quote unquote, the, the, the sorcerers are going to try to cure him, right? They're going to try to, because he got like whammy jammied in that one annual or wherever it was. No, it was in like issue 28, 29 mm -hmm. or something like that. And now we have universal again basically levitz has admitted this is a follow-up to that story or or inspired by that two-parter that we're talking about this 
is Paul Levitz with this volume writing his swan song. I get the feeling he knows for however long this volume lasts, this will be the last time he writes the Legion. I sort of get the sense that what he's doing is telling the stories that either, like you said, that he really liked or that he wants to expand for like a new generation or whatever, because he's never going to tell them again. Mm. So that's why it always feels like there's a finality to it. Like, like validus, like I'm going to answer the validus question. And for our purposes, validus feels gone, right? Like how do you come back unless you create a new validus, right? How do you come back from, from what more, like, does he have plans for Mordru? I don't think we get another Mordru story, although I could be wrong under Levitz, you know? So I'm not saying that he knows that he's going to, that, that he knows that this volume is going to run 63 issues and that somebody else, I just, I wonder in his mind, is he going, I think I have a limited time on them. My time is coming to an end because it's been how long, right? That he's been writing this book for now. And I I, I get the sense that it's like Levitz is trying to put his mark on Legion Mythos to maybe try to stop this weird thing that happens. Like, I didn't even include Time Trapper in there, right? We should include Time Trapper in there, too. So, like, what we just talked about, all the inconsistency that Universo has had over the years, Levitz is like, no, I'm going to make sure we we really come up with the definitive version of these characters so that they're either going to be taken off the map so I can create new characters or so that if we see them again, we don't have these inconsistencies anymore. This is the way, you know, we're in a different writing time. Things matter. People have, quite frankly, readers have longer memories, right? So you can't make those I don't want to call them mistakes, but you can't make those inconsistencies because readers are going to call you on it. They were already calling you on it in 66, 67, 60, you know, in, in that decade. They're definitely going to call you on it now. So I wonder, and I don't know if it's in an interview or anywhere, but we are halfway through this volume. Did Levitt sort of go? Because he's also higher up in the food chain in terms of where he is at DC. Like, he's got way more responsibilities. Like, he's probably like, God, I can't even do one book. Like, at some point, I got to go. I got to... When he's done writing this, he doesn't write another book, right? He doesn't write another book consistently. He just becomes DC's VP or whatever it is he is. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that's why we keep getting these echoes. And... Um, and why they're either expanded on, finalized, done with a, a greater sense of let me try to to really write them in a different in a new way or a different way. So um, and in terms of like this volume being its own thing, it really does become its own thing. So if you just want to read mm -hmm. one volume of the Legion, read this. Yeah. Because you you're you've already read five other stories that are the same. If you want to go back further, you're going to read these stories already. And they're probably not going to be as good, arguably. So that's my takeaway. I, that I, as always, Peter, you are, you are immensely perceptive because uh, as you were talking, I'm like, wait a minute, this, this idea sounds very familiar. And uh -huh. it, it is because, um, uh, as I always do, whenever we're going to uh, get into the next issue of of this of this run, I always turn to the uh, the Legion Companion yes uh, book to see is there anything in here relating to this particular story, this particular issue, this particular character, right? Right. And and so uh, I remembered that uh, in this interview with Paul Levitz, uh, the question is asked. You mentioned before that you were going to leave the Legion with issue number fifty. Ah. but you were persuaded to stick around another year and and uh the reason he cites as yeah i i was thinking about leaving the legion at that time because he had kids he had young kids that he wanted to you know uh, right. spend time with 
He right? said it so, in one of the letter columns. He just announced yeah, the birth of one of his kids in one of the Yeah, pieces. there you go. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I, I absolutely think you're right that he's 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 trying to uh put his either put his spin on on these characters, uh uh give them some sort of definitive story, such as Validus. Um uh continue or or somehow address some dangling threads involving these characters or the situations uh my only objection to this particular story so far is that it's 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 so much the same story as opposed to a continuation of something that's happened before right right but i i you know i'm probably prejudging it i've only read the first chapter um I, we don't know. I don't know how how this ends for Universo because this. I think this is really th- that's what this story is about. It well, it's, it's called the Universal Project, right? <laughs> so it's it's not really the, a Legion story. It's not necessarily a Saturn Girl story. Um, although I hope there's more to it. Like I said, I like I said, I said before, I hope this is more about how Universo deals with his issue with, with, uh, uh, killing, killing his son and the, his greater goal. Why does he even want to rule the world? Uh, you know, besides the fact that everybody wants to, uh, and if it is, what? if it is that he wants to rule the world it, or, or does it really, does it come back to Ron? Like, is he doing all this? Exactly. Is it, yes. Does it come back to him being a green lantern that he, he had all that power and he blew it, you know? And, and, and he could have been a he could have been a mentor to his son. He could have been somebody his son looked up to, but his son doesn't. His son always ends these stories crushed that he had to send his father to jail. Like, is that weighing in on him? And again, I don't even remember him. And we might be talking way too head cannony, but but that's <laughs> you know that that two parter is from almost twenty years prior to this, mm-hmm. right? And again, Legion fans their memories are are long um so on one hand maybe he thinks it's far enough away that it's okay to emulate that story because you can do it in a different way with new ideas you know not only to show what you're saying about rond and universo but also the legion how does it reflect back on the legion because that's that was one of the things i did like about that two-parter was it put the Legion in sort of like a, that new predicament that where they had to fight the law. And I, I learned that, you know, they were going to have chameleon boy do some espionage things. So when he, when they call on that little subsection of the Legion, he then suddenly becomes leader, right? Like he sort of takes over. And I was like, Oh, that's, that's cool. That's an interesting notion that he just, you know, he could, he could supersede whoever is Legion leader. Um, because he has that expertise, right? So you learn something about the Legion in that process, you know, and um, yeah, uh, it's, I think it's kind of, I think it's fun to, to, to hold that mirror back because again, I think the Universal himself has just been so inconsistent and so boring in his motivations. So you're yeah. right. What, what else is there? Is is there anything else number one right. and if we do get that yeah that'll be fun that'll be fun and then just to top that off you know uh, as as levitz has been doing we've seen a pattern that he takes these characters off the board yeah and so is this the final universal project uh universal story right at least until the universe is rebooted right until five years later or whatever yeah. <laughs> right right yeah yeah it's been so long. Do we? Is there a Universal story in that? In he's that he's involved. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, yeah I figured, but <laughs> in a much different way. He's yeah. He's he's involved in that. If there's one thing to go back to our early conversation at the top of the episode, if there's one thing I learned about those previous Legion stories prior to, I want to say prior to 300, but maybe prior to like when the Legion fully took over the Superboy book or whatever, like from, from there backwards, there's a lot of inconsistencies and, and villains are, are not as interesting as they are later, which is true of every, Oh yeah. yeah. Any, any concept that has survived from the silver age, of course their characters are going to be much more interesting later. 
um, you know, people can argue this point, but, you know, as writing gets a little more sophisticated and whatever, you know, you mm-hmm. get to do more things, you know, that's why people love the Steve Englehart, Marshall Rogers, Batman run, you know, because mm-hmm. it was so fun, groundbreaking. And, you know, the same thing with Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams on Green Lantern and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it makes me appreciate those older stories. Like when I, like I said, I read that two-parter and then you read this and just, just the stupid little hand-holding at the end. I was like, Ooh, yay, that's fun. That's what they did back then. See, that's why we love, that's why I'm a Legion fan, you know? So yeah, I can, yeah. I can learn to appreciate those older stories more. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. So, uh, Peter, I have, I have a couple, uh, I guess, nitpicks regarding Universal's plan. We already talked a little bit about, um, his scheme, but I, <laughs> he has engineered i mean the, the scope of his plan is 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 so grand and and you have to give him some uh some props for what he's accomplished pulling it off pulling off all this stuff right uh despite the fact that it, he's done something very similar before <laughs> uh but but he's done it again you know okay give give him give him give him credit for that right mm-hmm. because he's done it again Again, under the noses of the Legion, the science police, the government, all this stuff, right? Um, but then he goes and, you know, he separated the Legion, which is, you know, uh, perhaps based on his previous um, uh, similar attempt that we, we, we just discussed. Uh, he's learned from this and decided, okay, I can't have all the Legionnaires on Earth. That, that, that didn't work out last time. So I'm going to break them up. I'm going to, I'm going to send the, the most powerful ones off into dominator space. Uh, the, the result of which we, you know, we haven't seen yet. Uh, maybe he's hoping the dominators will blast them out of, out of the sky or out of, out of orbit or, you know, whatever. Uh, he's got, uh, some other powerful members on high Kreis and we got the whole Zamir thing going on. So maybe, you know, uh, Zim, Zamir with, uh, Tell us his friend, you know, with those guys, maybe they'll dispatch those legionnaires, you know, whatever. Right. But then he takes um, ostensibly the smartest legionnaires and puts them all on the same planet on this prison planet. Why does he just kill off these legionnaires? He's, he has shown that he's willing to kill his own son. Hmm. What's his problem with killing off a few more legionnaires? Would that break the other legionnaires' mental hold if they knew their friends had died? I don't know because we don't know where they're at. Well, but even even still, he, he wouldn't have to kill them, you know, in the same spot together, right? right so, right. Uh, like you said, you know, how much time has passed? I, I I I I tend to think that not much time has passed here. This happened again, demonstrating his ability to effectively uh execute this plan uh, i think this happened overnight that mm. uh he, you know everybody fell asleep and then he went in he put you know his minions went in and transported those four legionnaires onto that prison planet wherever it is um uh, who knows what he's we don't know yet what he's done with all the other legionnaires uh, i assume something very similar maybe he has it's not just one world maybe it's multiple worlds or maybe they're all in the same world but they're in different spots. Although I think center girl says something about, she thinks that there's only this one Island or there's only a couple, I don't know what it was, but anyway, it's just, <laughs> uh, Oh, and, and speaking of the prison planet, you know, why have these mindless drones watching things and sort of keeping people in, um, uh, uh, from escaping or, or, or straying from what they're supposed to do instead of, other mind controlled minions uh, being able to interact with them and um, uh, report back or, or even just having the drones ha- have a, have a video feed <laughs> of what's going on. Right. So there's, uh, uh, is it hubris? Is it, is it, um, is it Short just, I did this. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's just what just the, the plot, the plot holes here are really big, but uh, I'm willing to let them slide. Uh, as we go into this uh, for now. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. And now it made me think that maybe there's more to the characters that are on the prison planet because she recognizes a Green Lantern uh, Zudarian. It's the same race as Tomar Ray. She recognizes Gas Girl. Um, we have the other Legionnaires on there. And then there's other characters in the background that I'm like, okay, that n- night looking girl the shining knight looking girl that right? she's standing in front of on whatever page that is on page 17 i thought we either saw her or we will see her again later mm-hmm. uh, um a previous or a couple pages before that on page 13 why is that guy wearing a domino mask mm-hmm. why is the guy in the background so strong that he can carry a tree why is what's his face from the Garfield comic here? <laughs> I was going to ask you if you'd seen that. You know, <laughs> so um, even the guy that helps her on page number six, he's got that swirling stuff around his head. I thought it was Mano there for a while. I was like, well, mm. who is that? So clearly these are all super powered beings. It has right. to be. Right. So he's. He's created a planet because, again, where's Atmos? Is Atmos on this planet, right, yeah. somewhere? He's he's wiped out. He's trying to wipe out all the superheroes that are not in the Legion of Superheroes. So that's a huge – that's huge. So what's easier? Do you round them up and shunt them away or do you kill them? Like I don't, I don't know what's easier in the short amount of – if we're to take well, that this only happened overnight. Uh, well, yeah, if you have – Assuming he has this, if you have Zamir at your beck and call, you just can. transport them all into space or into the sun or so, you know, right. It's just, right. there, there are ways around this very easily. Uh, but yeah, I, 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 I will concede your point for now. I, I, you know, maybe like, yeah, exactly. So if, if, if this, if, if the timeline is everybody fell asleep and he had to evacuate a certain number of people uh, very quickly, it'd be perhaps easier just to dump them on this prison planet, I guess. And also, what's the fun in killing them if you can, if they can live constantly under your power and you get well, to gloat and... Right, so so maybe this is the first part of his plan. While he has them isolated, he's executing these other things, and then down the road, he'll bring them in, and then, yeah, then then exactly, he can. He can then reveal to the world, and I think this is this is the his... the 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 hubris problem in, in, yeah. uh, in regards to Universo is that sure. he has to gloat. Uh, right. We've seen him do it multiple times to himself, but he's not the kind of guy who can just sit back. And even though that's, that's how his plans always start being someone either in uh, behind the scenes or uh, in a disguise. Uh, but eventually he reveals to the world, Hey, I'm, I'm the big bad. So, right. you know, suck it. Right. <laughs> I'm going to write a story. It's literally going to be maybe one issue long where you're going to get introduced to all these cool new heroes and they're just going to die. A villain's just going to like blow them up. And at the end of the story, it's like, he's going to take over the world and that's it. Mm. The end. Cause it's mm. like, you never get that story because you can't. Cause there's no, how do you write a, a title like that? Right? Like I'm going to, it's going to be one comic from a publisher that exists for only one comic because that's it. That's the universe. It's the universe of heroes that die and the villains take over the end. <laughs> that could be fun. <laughs> um, uh, to, uh, I'm sure you, you already know this, but uh, in terms of the char- the new characters that you noted, mm-hmm. you know, I, uh, some of them were very conspicuous. So I'm like, who, who are these characters? So I, I did some, while I didn't read the future issues, uh, coming up, I did. I did discover that uh, these are some of them are new to cool. to uh, to the Legion um, uh, lore. So great, be fun to see how that all plays out. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Because, like I said, they either they're either tickling my brain or they're just too obvious in their in their construction, like on mm-hmm. the page. And you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, what is this? Is which actually, to be fair, I only really thought of that notion when you mentioned the notion of rounding up you know, the, the, the villain, like the heroes, like just, the, I was like, Oh yeah, that's right. That's what these heroes are. Aren't they? Or that's what this planet is. It's a, it's a way where it's a holding station for the larger and, Legion characters. 
And I will say too, that the whole idea of, again, uh, coming back to the execution of his plan, you know, give him, give him some credit. So yeah, these people are under his sway and they don't know who they are or question why they're there, except for obviously Saturn girl. Um, but he has them doing manual labor, keeping their minds occupied with things, you know, uh, very uh, basic things, you know. Right. Fields, um, sleep. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, work, eat, sleep. Yeah. That's it. Right. So uh, I, that, I think that's a, that's a really cool idea that, you know, he, he's thinking in terms of how, how, well, and maybe, maybe it's just simply a matter of his uh, ability to control so many people. Maybe there's a limit to that. And so he has to supplement that with, with things like this, as opposed to, cause he, cause you know, the, um, as far as we know, he's not using uh, the water supply to uh, 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 have people ingest mind control right. chemicals or whatever. So, you know, <laughs> he's doing something different, a little different, right? But he's also learning, right? We got to give yeah. him prop because he did send, uh, well, there was those legionnaires in that two-parter that got arrested and sent to the Tacron Galtos planet. And they were, you know, miners or working on washboards, but he didn't control them. He just, he left mm. it up to the warden to go make sure you, you know, at least this time he's like, okay, they're going to be away, but this time I'm going to make sure that they stay away. You know, so, yeah. You know, he's learning. That's good. <laughs> Smart villain. Sometimes I have a, a, if you have anything else, um, little things, Imra, Imra calls her second son Val, right? So at this point, the, the, the twin that was Validus is still named Validus creepy, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> um, gets a different name later, but uh, I was like, Ooh, Ooh, that's creepy. Uh, just to make a quick point that I think, I think this is the first double page spread in the Baxter run. I don't think we've ever gotten a double page spread before, have we? Or if we did, it was, it was like designed to be two pages, but it was still like in panel format. I can't remember a double page spread for, in two and three. It's like back in the old uh, Warlord comic where Mike Carell used to always do issue two and three as a, a double page spread in the Warlord book. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I guess I didn't, I wasn't, wasn't realizing this, um, but what a great way, you know, what a great page turn to reveal where she is and just kind of the, the lance, the, literally the landscape of, of her location that, yeah, what a, that's, that's really cool. Yeah. But whether it's the first one or not in the run, it, it, it is, it's noteworthy at least mm -hmm. for, for these couple issues. You know. I have one more thing here. It's, it's, <laughs> page 18 saturn girl is carrying dream girl and she says dreamy is gaining weight again she said first of all she says again yeah and then she goes heaven knows where though i was like oh oh first of all i was like dream girl got a boob job or part of me was even like is levitt's hinting that she's pregnant yeah like, that's like, that's what oh. that's where my mind went right yeah <laughs> <laughs> but I just thought it was interesting. You know, readers always say we shouldn't think now about the five years later. But when when Saturn Girl says Dreamy's gaining weight again, I was like, oh, so this is a thing. And then five years later, it is a thing with Dream Girl about gaining mm. weight. So I was like, oh, mm -hmm. that's interesting. Very interesting. Ah, yeah. So small little whatever. I, but. I thought that was more, you know, someone as uh ostensibly vain as dream girl you know probably has she goes through stages where you know she gains some weight and she's you know she's not going to allow that right so she's she constantly is struggling with her weight and gaining and then losing and gaining and losing and so yeah and she's not afraid to party so you know yeah exactly i don't know what that means in 30th century terms but the only other notion the only other thing note that I have is about is from the letter column in issue 37 about mm -hmm. this issue. Yeah. I got a couple things here too. All right. Mine is about, is yours about this issue? Yeah. Okay. We'll go with those first and then I'll, okay. I'll do mine. Uh, just two things generally. 
uh, uh, people really like the focus and depiction of Saturn Girl and the issue. So we we're responding to the same kinds of things that they did back then. Uh, and then uh, one thought on this first chapter, uh, quote, has the hallmark of becoming an epic on the level of the dark side saga. Mm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I I really I I I'm I'm hoping that in future letter columns I will run across that same letter writer and then and get uh, I forget who his or her reaction to this. Right. Yeah, I mean and again it's still early in in comics usage of multi-part stories and and event stories. Like it's so different. You know, Great Darkness Saga is like the Dark Phoenix saga, where they those storylines just sort of snuck up. They knew the they knew their comics were leading to this story, but it was like that's the point. They're leading to that story, you know. Mm -hmm. Universal Project is kind of like Judas Contract, where things were leading to that story and they're going to culminate in a four issue branded thing, right? Right. And then you have something like Who Is Censor Girl, which is is just a through line narrative story the same way i don't know you know like simonson on thor the, the whole surter saga and mm. beta it's this long form story that you're just telling with all these little other chapters and that don't even relate to it along the way so mm -hmm. they're all different this is not great darkness i would never compare this to <laughs> i wouldn't compare no. it to it story wise or construction wise it's not the yeah. same yeah it's not the same there is, I don't think the Legion has ever had, you, I guess you could argue, argue Final Crisis, Legion of Three Worlds, sort of Great Darkness level, sort of, because it's a thousand cast of characters, you know, mm. and, but uh, there's never been another Great Darkness saga. Yeah. Yeah. And there never will be Bendis. Okay. <laughs> my, my notion from, the, from that letter column is that um, again readers are writing in about be careful with the post-crisis inspiration story for the legion and someone said why don't you just put monel into superman's time instead of superboy's time and paul levitz reveals that that actually was going to be a part of the story for man of steel number six but they were going to try to possibly weave that in as part of that that six issue exploration of the new Man of Steel, the new Superman for Burn and for DC, and then they just decided not to, I guess, hmm. that they because they were going to go with what they're going to go with, you know. Uh, I see. I, I, go ahead. Yeah, I I I, I want to know more about this. Uh, the 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 decisions into that and and why this as opposed to that and and yeah. why didn't they just do it? They could have done three three pages. Oh, yeah. by the way, like they could have done like now that he's revealed himself as Superman. Here's here's a five page sequence of of various larger points within the DC universe that he has to still be involved with, but we're not going to flesh it out. We're just going to say they still exist post crisis. One of them is he has an adventure. Oh, I meet this teenager who I sent away, you know, to the Phantom Zone and, and a hundred years from now, he's part of the Legion. Boom, done. Never have to deal with anything mm -hmm. else again. Yeah. You know, um, um same thing with like the formation of the justice league look how long the origin story of the justice league it took to finish that because superman couldn't be they, they didn't want superman to be part of the or even though he was but he wasn't right like they had like him and batman weren't really supposed to be and they threw in like some other characters but eventually black canary becomes in place of wonder woman you know right. and it's only like five of them instead of seven of them and then eventually that they did away with that anyway and it's you know so it's <laughs> like you could have just you could have you know, maybe that was burn going no i don't want to no like get out of my book keep your <laughs> peanut butter out of my chocolate you know but when i read that that was you know again i've had these comics in my collection for how long and i was like oh what oh, oh that was gonna be a man of steel six they could have solved everything mm-hmm Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And and didn't they eventually adopt that anyway uh, when they brought Monel into uh, the the L E G I O N book? Right, but and, it was all wrapped up in like invasion and yeah, yeah. But then w- the the colonization that I, I, as I recall, there was some story about that about how you know he was he helped inspire that or he helped them. I, I forget mm-hmm. now, but mm-hmm. but it was a very very direct legion connection um there that would would play out a thousand years later yeah over on the uh, legion of substitute podcasters they're going through the valor series right now so listeners can go listen to that if they want to hear that yeah maybe by that point at man of steel six levitz was like i'm already figuring this out so let's just go with it you know <laughs> let's just go with what we're going to do and create yeah. a whole bunch of headaches <laughs> i can't wait till we get to that oh my lord DC, you know, it's again, it's hindsight, but like, take, for example, Hawk, Hawkman post-crisis mm-hmm. was that Hawk world. The first three issue miniseries of Hawk world is brilliant. Tim Truman and company is it's, it stays true to the origin story. It fleshes it out. It develops it. It makes that character really sort of solid. Then they start the Hawk world series. All they had to do was write one caption box at the on page one that said 10 years later. That's all they had to do. But instead they said, this is the first time the Hawk people have come to earth. And it was like, oh my God, you just, you just, and then it, from there on, it was like, they never recovered from that. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're putting, you know, the golden age Hawkman on justice league as kind of like a, a, a liaison between the society and the league and doing all this. And there's a fake, Hawkman during invasion and it's like oh my god you just could have said five years later something five years later from the original Hulk, they would have saw you know it's like you want to go back in time it's like Ron Vidar give me a time cube I'm going to go back in time and say hey you're going to do this and it's going to ruin you for 20 years yeah yeah if your whole if your whole point in crisis was to simplify your universe don't recomplicate it don't yeah right <laughs> All right, let's continue on. This is obviously going to be a, a little bit of a lengthy episode, but that's okay. Oh, uh, are we going to oh. go to the other other comics? Yeah, you have something uh, else. W- one more thing. Uh, yeah. I just want to. I just want to say um, it was in in that letter column in issue thirty seven. Uh, Levitz does pinpoint where issue thirty one fell in uh, publishing history. Mm, okay, and, and and we were right. Good. Our our, our guess between Adventure three fifty one and three fifty two. Right. Uh, we were correct about that. Tiny, so. tiny, small window. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Now let's go into the, the other chapter, the other segment in our episodes where we get to look at the DC Legion of Superheroes in the larger DC universe at this time, as we, as we just sort of talked about, you know, as they're trying to fit the Legion into whatever the post-crisis DC universe is. So we're going to talk about who's who, 25 featuring entries on Valibus, Wanderers, White Witch, and Wildfire. I have a, a few little thoughts about Booster Gold 14, which also also shipped. All these books came out in December of 1986. We're at the end of 1986. Um, we don't necessarily have to talk about Legends because there is no Legion uh, connection in Legends number five. Um, and I really don't have any thoughts other to say it continues to be terrible. Um, <laughs> and then that's it. Cosmic Boy number four also came out in December, but you've already listened to that Tales episode on Cosmic Boy. Haven't you? They better. <laughs> um, so so we just, uh, we'll just round out. Let's start with um, Who's Who. And let's start with uh, the entry for Validus as drawn by Kurt Swan, and this time with inks by Larry Malstead. What did you learn? What did you like? What did, let's talk about Validus. Well, there is a typo. Yeah, cut off. <laughs> well, not only that, um, uh, Liz, <laughs> Liz Validus is five feet tall. <laughs> 750 pounds, five feet tall. Oh, that's such a mistake. But yeah, there, there's a missing line in this. And I even went to the the digital version, hoping that maybe they had corrected it. 
and they did not. Ooh, I know people who have the omnibus. So I wonder if they, yeah. I guess they didn't correct it in that. You know? I would so think not. Again, DC's like, yay, look, look, we're cleaning these things up and look how shiny and new. Oh, by the way, <laughs> this is a mistake. Yeah. Um, uh, besides that. Um, maybe well, wait. maybe he's five foot when he's a kid and yet is still 750. <laughs> That'd be Don't brilliant. pick that kid up. <laughs> You'll break your back. Um uh, uh, so it says here he was thrust back in time over a decade. Uh, so I guess the last, uh, so what, what I, what I put here, the last, so the last nearly 30 years at that time was compressed into 10, you know, the, the 30 years of publication history. Yeah. Um, but, but that, and that fits into the whole idea of, you know, that sliding 10 year scale that DC and Marvel sure. often pull, uh, pull out and say, yeah, look, this is our, our timeline, uh, of everything. I'll even I'll even give them fifteen because it does say over a decade. That so that's true. Yeah, you could mm-hmm. you could argue. You know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So how tall do you think Validus is? He's not well, he, five foot, obviously. No, he fluctuates. <laughs> right. Sometimes he's like nine, ten feet. Other times he's like fifteen, twenty feet. I, right. Exactly. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. I'm. I I just like to think he's inconsistent. Like it's almost like the Hulk. Really. Ra- I I want to say when he rages out, he gets bigger. Ah, that's a cool idea. Yeah, I like that. When Tellus freed him during the crisis, he was gigantic. Mm-hmm. And then when Kurt Swan draws him, he's just sort of like a tall basketball player. And yeah. then, you know, <laughs> and then he becomes taller than buildings because he's raging out. So, yeah, I, I, I would tend to go with a, like a, about 15, because if you look at the scale on this page with him, with other characters, that, that appears to be about, uh, about that, that yeah. height. But sure. But uh, to your point, you know, there's there's two images, two uh, two images here, one with uh, Therok and then one with his father, um, Lightning Lad. And yeah, uh, when he's when he's with Therok, he appears to be a little shorter, despite the fact he's kind of hunched over a little bit. But then when he's battling Lightning Lad, he is he looks even taller than that. So I that that, there you go. You've you've uh, you've hit on something that uh, they've only hinted at. I do like, uh, I mean, the artwork's fine. It's it's Kurt Swan, Liar mm-hmm. Malstead. Yeah, it's totally fine. The the title logo, there's really not much to that. But I like the very last paragraph. It is not yet known whether there are any continuing effects from his period of transformation. Mm-hmm. Again, people saying that we shouldn't think about five years later. It's too early. You're wrong. Because I look at that and I go, yeah, that's exactly what happens in five years later. <laughs> we find out what happens because of little, little, what do they call him at that time? Garrodin, I think. Yeah. His, they, they give him a new name at, in the five years later or somewhere along the way. Right now, he's still known as Validus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It even says here, full name, Validus Rands. Mm-hmm. That's kind of so. like, that's kind of like Fantastic Four and Doctor Doom. Where Doctor Doom, when Sue was giving birth to the, the their second child, and I think Doom helped her give birth to it, mm-hmm. or something like that, and and they said, well, he said, if I'm going to do this, then I get to name the baby and names it Valer- Valeria, and they mm-hmm. they it sticks. They they the kid's name's it's like you're going to name your child after your greatest villain's desire. Like what? That's weird. <laughs> Like, imagine it's the same. I think we talked about it, the same thing with computer. Like, here comes little baby Validus, like Santa girls chasing it. Validus, Val- and somebody's going, oh, oh, Valid, what? Oh, it's just the kid. You know, they're probably freaking out when they hear that name. <laughs> uh, I didn't really, there really wasn't much else. I mean, no, they, I, I like what they talked about. Like, he was a, a perpetual infant, he became known as a galaxy wide menace. Even to the notion that before the Fatal Five first appearance, that he probably was menacing before mm-hmm. that, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, oh, that, that's kind of cool. I want to read those stories of like this rampaging monster through the 30th century. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Well, we did get a, a tiny sliver of that in that one annual when True. he was attacking whatever planet that was. Yeah. Okay. Wanderers. One of my favorite concepts of the legion of superheroes even though i've never read an issue with them i've only read them when they just sort of make i i know i'm telling you it's weird 
I saw them, you know, they made an appearance in the Great Darkness Saga mm-hmm. you know, and a couple other places. That, but that was my first encounter with them. I'm like, who are these characters? I think it was just because of this who's who entry that I was like, there's a a team other than the Legion of Superheroes and the Heroes of Lot. Like, wow, that's cool. Who are they? Oh, they uh-huh. get their own book in a couple years? Well, they must be cool. Well, I've never read it. Why do I like it so much? I don't know. <laughs> but you've read it. Well, uh, I I read their first appearance in Adventure Comics 375 uh, because like you, I was like, I I knew of them from the Great Darkness Saga issue or issues that they appeared in. Um, I even bought the first issue of The Wanderers when, uh, what, in what, about a year from from publication time where we're at? 89, something like that. Yeah, and... Maybe I got more than more than just the first issue. I think I got the first couple issues. And then I'm like, I, eh, I only have the first issue. <laughs> this is not good. But then I later, like within the last two three years, I have I now have all the issues. So I need to go through and read them. But but those are those are different characters than the ones we're talking about here. Right. Right. Uh, they are they are changed some in some cases, uh, in some cases more than than others. So, uh, so yeah, I had to go back and, and, uh, read because in, in this, in this entry, so this is the art here is done by, um, uh, Mike Clark and, uh, Pablo Marcus. It's just a group shot, um, of all of them. You get, you get, you, I love the, the headshots cause you know, that, that, that evokes Legion to me. So that's cool. But, um, they talk about this, this meetup between the Legion and this group. And I realized, well, I'd never, I never read that. So what issue was that? And, and uh, I found it in, in my, like I said, my, my omnibuses. So um, <laughs> I was, I, there's not much there, Peter. Uh, you really don't need to read it. It's just that uh, it, it was an excuse to introduce a new set of characters that they then, the Legion then had to battle because they, the, 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 the Wanderers, even though they're this well-known at that time, because uh, you know, the Legion knows of them, um, even though they, that, like I said, in that issue, they are introduced to each other and that, and then the way that they, they depict this meeting is like, it's like, they're going to battle against each other, but there's like, Oh, Hey, nice to meet you. <laughs> um, anyway, so they, they go through this cloud, this nebula, uh, the Nefar as a nefarious nebula, um, that then changes their personality for, I think they said two weeks. And so the Legion had to go um, apprehend them. So that was the whole excuse. Uh, so, yeah, there's there's really not much there. Uh, they're not that interesting. Um, their power sets are not that great <laughs> comparatively. Uh, but but they are similar to the Legion in that they they basically have one thing that they do well uh, for the most part. The best thing about this that issue, uh, Peter, though, was this idea. There are first aid satellites all over the galaxy in strategic locations that the legionnaires can call upon if 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 any of them are injured. I'm like, where? Why is Levitt's not played with that idea? Because <laughs> they've advanced to med kits and and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, probably. Yeah, that's cool. But yeah, the, these characters, uh, I. Like I said, I I was introduced to them in the Great Darkness Saga. Didn't know anything about them, uh, but it was that that launch of their series in '88, where they are, like I said, different characters. And so these Wanderers aren't quite the same as the Wanderers I sort of kind of started to know, right? Um, from that series. So yeah, right. it, they're a it's a weird place that they fill in Legion history. Not to mention, first of all, they had, you know, so few appearances, but yet they get a full page spread on the yeah. issue two when there are literally, you know, 20 other characters that have made more appearance that don't get in the first volume. It's yeah, it's very strange unless they knew that mm-hmm. that other title was coming up. So they were like, you know, let, let's just at least use it as a you know promotion. You know? Yeah, um, there's a mistake on the who's who entry. Um, they have all the headshots, so they have Celebrand, Dartalat, Dartalg, and Elvo. But Elvo and Dartalg should be swapped. Yeah, they're not the. Uh, they have the the headshots in the wrong place. 
And it does make me wonder, like, you could have done a really nice thing with Immorto. A mysterious rejuvenating force within Immorto's body literally prevented him from being killed. He frequently employed a ray gun. That could have just been Immorto Man in the mm-hmm. 30th century. You could have totally just formed, you know, made him Immorto Man. And maybe he's the real reason why they're all together. And um, I, I would, God, oh, you know, I'm sure we will eventually get to their run, you know, in three years or whatever. And it's like, I want to read them, but I just know it's going to be bad. And <laughs> the, the promise that they, you know, it's in their name, the Wanderers. It could be like the, she, the, the Imperial Guard or the Star Jammers meet Star Trek in the 30th century. You know, mm-hmm. they could totally be exploring the the unknown cosmos hence their name yeah and, yeah, it, yeah it's perfect it is it is it is star trek in the legion mm-hmm. opportunity here and they just ruin it <laughs> we can only have one super group in the 31st century. i guess that's so lame no uh even their logo the wanderer looks like you know balloon art or yeah that 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 was the one thing about this picture that's like that's that's an odd choice yeah very very obscure okay white witch mike DiCarlo and larry malstead our own misa she only goes by one name misa misa now well not even now so you notice that that's one of the things yeah. i i i uh i touched on on on, on this is she's not she's not identified in this entry at least as as a now and and on top of that she has other alter egos which are not listed here but i think they're talked about in the in the entry oh you know she was first known as the hag Mm -hmm. and then uh zola ag so uh, yeah this this is a weird a weird entry for who this person is uh, in those terms yeah i mean she's really she really comes across as like even though she she predates some of them, like she's like a mix of Scarlet Witch and magic from the New Mutants because mm. she's her powers aren't necessarily set. She has to keep constantly. She has to learn and train and and then her whole thing with Mordru and how he interfered with her teaching is very much like Belasco and magic and mm. you know kind of kind of hitting the same beats a little bit. But yeah, there's there. Yeah, there's something, uh, you know, they talk about how she is um, uh, an oddity on her planet, right? Because she doesn't have the precog abilities like her right. sister does, right? Right. Um, which, which then uh, she left, the, she left uh, uh, Naltor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Why can't I remember that name? Uh, she left her home planet and then that's what, you know, she ends up on the, on the sorcerer's world and, and she, she pursues that her abilities there, I guess, or, or her knowledge there. Right. But I know we've, we've, we've seen that kind of a story before in the Legion with lightning Lord in particular. Right. So he's, he's an oddball on Winath. And so I, I was just in, in my mind, I was thinking, you know, I wonder if, if they ever, in, in some future story, if they ever talked about that aspect, that, that uh, comparative aspect in their lives where they were the, the odd man out uh, on their home world and how that impacted them. Yeah. So at least she didn't go bad. <laughs> she never became the black witch. She did later. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I, th- I, th- I thought. So <laughs> yeah. I don't remember why. But. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also, you know, is her, is her, uh, quote unquote limitation. I don't know if you think of it that way, but you know, in terms, like you said, you know, she has to, she has to study and she has to prepare her spells you know, is that unique to her on Sorcerer's World? Or is that because it, it doesn't appear that way, you know, like uh, in terms of uh, Mordru, he just throws magic around like it's nothing. Yeah. So, um, you know, how does how does that how does that impact her uh, in her studies on Sorcerer's World with the other magicians, even though we, you know, we just found out recently that that, um, you know, they want her to to come and be a teacher and and uh, they respect her abilities and whatnot. So I, you know, there's, uh, there's just, I, I think there's some things about this character that haven't been explored yet that uh, could wear very well, you know, be a, a, a good issue uh, spotlighting right. her. Yeah. You, you think about her age, 
She's basically an off-worlder to Sorcerer's World, although I think so are many of the other ones. Mm-hmm. But it seems like she's was wouldn't be like maybe their first choice, right? So, because isn't that that was one was that in one of our stories we read or one of the tales where she's like, well, then I'm gonna go claim magic, you know? Like if I can't do this, then I'm gonna go do that, right? Mm-hmm. Like I thought it was her choice, but I can't remember. Um, yeah, she chose to leave Naltor. Um, yeah, she's, uh, she's really a background character in this volume that we're reading. I yeah. Mean, other than the, the one backup tale she had, there's not a lot of white witch stories. So that'll be, you know, we talked about this being the halfway point more or less. Um, let's see who Levitz decides to focus on in, in our next run of issues. You know, mm-hmm. we've, we've gotten a lot of, a lot of other people that we don't really need to see again. We, it's time for other people to take the, take the front. And we should make note. We, we, we said the artists, but that this is Mike DiCarlo doing the art. Yeah. I, I had that in my notes too. I was, I was going to ask you, uh, because I know DiCarlo as an inker, right? And I'm, you know, obviously he, he's inked, uh, the Legion issue we just talked about, uh, and many others, right? So, um, uh, what's your experience with DiCarlo as a, as a penciler, not an inker? I mean, it's fine, right? Like I, you, you have to wonder if Milestead came in and maybe softened some of the DiCarlo stuff. Like you can mm-hmm. sort of see DiCarlo like in that ultra boy image. Oh yeah. A tiny bit. I yeah. thought so. I, I, I would say more than a tiny bit, but yeah, maybe even <laughs> invisible kids face, but uh, the rest of it's like, okay, yeah, inkers probably, you know, if they're not originally pencilers, they're going to learn something along the way, but it's good. It's fine. It totally is fine. It's, it's not anything spectacular. It's not mm-hmm. terrible. It's totally fine. But the, you know, her, her main pose here, I thought was, you know, compared to other entries where I don't know, right. they're, they're, uh, more of, I guess, more of a traditional action pose. You know, hers is very much, uh, I'm casting a spell and I love how whoever the color artist on in this who's who issue is, or maybe this entry, I don't know, um, uh, showed, you know, that at least in my book, it's the, the, the pink circles and everything and the, the mm-hmm. motion of her arms and it's, it's just unusual, but I, but I like it. Yeah. It's good. What do you, what do you think of the logo for her? Yeah. All right. <laughs> so, come on. It's better than the Wanderers. Yeah, I just feel like the 30th century one should be more designy. But mm. I get it. That's fine. Wildfire. Dave Cockrum making mm-hmm. a return uh, to to Wildfire. Um, and that logo is fine. You know, still, it's not very 30th century, but it's you know, better than White Witches. Um, I feel like that logo we've seen or variations of it we've seen relating to this character before. So uh, it, it makes sure. sense. Absolutely. And did, uh, didn't did Dave Cockrum come up with this character or or mm-hmm. design the character for his first appearance? Yep. Carrie Bates and Dave Cockrum. Yeah. Superboy in the Legion 195. Yeah. Yep. Um, fan favorite of a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, I like that the, in the image they show him being destroyed. Just so you know that that is part of his deal, <laughs> <laughs> and and along with that, uh, you because know, they make note. Doo, doo, doo. Oh yeah, uh, how how his containment each containment suit slightly alters his powers. Mm. I don't think they've they've really played with that to to any great extent, uh, and I wish they would. Although, you know, uh, his very first appearance, he had much like Starboy when he first appeared. He had all these different powers. He was basically uh, five or six legionnaires rolled up into one. Yeah. And then after he was first destroyed and came back later, you know, he became what well, you know the character that we now know as Wildfire. Yeah, he should be like the Wasp, and just whenever a new artist <laughs> takes over, they just design slightly redesign the costume because, yeah, yeah. and then that's why it's different because a new artist is just going to depict the powers differently. So Mm -hmm. you could just write it off as an artist thing. Like that's the reason why he's so different, but in under his powers and weapons, that's the part that I really like. He waived personal combat training as none of his containment suits allow for complex enough movements 
necessary for effective use of the more sophisticated techniques. Now, are mm -hmm. they talking fighting? Are they talking? You would think he'd be able to fly like a like nobody's business, right? Mm -hmm. um, but or you know a containment suit that sort of limits it. That there's something interesting about that as just a person, as his continuing struggle with being human, whatever that means for him. Like, don't he can fight and he can zap and he can fly around, but don't let him hold a puppy or an egg, you know, <laughs> like, is it that, is, are they talking that sophist kind of sophistication <laughs> or are they talking just, he's not a fighter because he can't move fast. And I don't know. I, yeah, to me, it suggested that he can't be like, he can't do moves like karate kid because that would, that would damage his suit. But yet, mm. you know, they, he's always constantly going up against really powerful villains in the stories. And yeah, sometimes he, you know, his, his containment suit gets ruptured. But that doesn't seem to be an issue uh, relating to that. So, I mean. Yeah. I, and, and if, if I, I wondered if it was like Cannonball from New Mutants. Mm. Like, he just, he could only go one way because it's <laughs> so fast. And it took him a while to learn how to steer and flip mm, the ball. Maybe, kind of yeah. Sure. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, well, it's just interesting. What were you going to say? Uh, I, you know, the whole no combat training, I, 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 I found that a bit slightly ironic because you know, considering his relationship with the Legion Academy students and how really? he, he's a mentor and, and teacher and to some degree, and, and yet he's not having to do the combat training. Yeah. There's something very counter there. I don't Yeah. Know. Didn't he put Quizlet through some, mm-hmm exercises and yeah you know which that sort of made sense you know you can almost see those the, the two of them are kind of cut from the same cloth when it comes to the notion that they live within a containment uh, yeah they're whatever. contained yeah yeah well that that plays out later i believe yeah uh, but the image is fine it's it's dave cockrum you know it's um you know it's a it's a big pose the colors are fine he's a favorite you know it's wildfire i don't know if i learned all that much yeah than no. what we just talked uh about. considering that th this character's had two spotlights uh over the years I, plus you know his introduction so yeah he's well trotted yeah okay so then um Talked about how there's no things in legend. That story just is going on and on and whatever. <clears throat> um, and that particular chapter, issue five, it's really just, once again, going through the DC universe as Dr. Fate gathers heroes to fight G. Gordon Godfrey, who is now at the Lincoln Memorial staging his own, ja his own January 6th insurrection. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, um, dark side just laughing in the background saying that he won you know i'm destroying the perception america's perception of the heroes so i win it's like okay whatever so that'll come to a head with issue six but no legion appearance in that booster girl 14 the only reason i'm bringing this up is we talked about it last episode um booster gold has to travel to the future and to do this he he gets the help from Rip Hunter, post-crisis Rip Hunter, who is struggling to discover time, uh, or, you know, time travel and ha has a time sphere, but he is not the time master that we know from pre-crisis. So they all manage to get sent to the future, but um, um, the time sphere that they traveled in is they need to fix it. It actually gets blown up in this issue, so I don't know how they return to the past, so I'll have to figure that out. But there's some interesting commentary about the larger DC universe in terms of time, etc., leading into conversations we've been having about the time storm and stuff that's going to happen with Superboy, etc. So they're in the 25th century, um, Rip Hunter and, and uh, his partner, whose name I can't remember at the moment. And... They're walking around and Rip Hunter says, uh, I'd, I'd expected technology to, to progress a bit more than this in 500 years from 1986 to, to now. Society here seems intriguingly similar to our own 
In fact, I'm surprised that there even is a city called Gotham anymore, given the growth of Metropolis and New York in our own time. And as we know from Legion, Metropolis winds up absorbing, you know, every like the entire like New England coast or whatever, you know, although or down to like Maryland or wherever. So it's like become this megaopolis. Um, so that's the first notion that time is, is sort of progressing slower than than Rip Hunter thinks. And that that's kind of fun because, you know, we've read a lot of DC stuff where you could in 1980s, you go to the year 2000 and it's like this highly future place. But yet now we we're here in the 2000s and it's still the same old schmucky place it's been since the <laughs> cars got better. But and we have, you know, smartphones, but that's it. That's it. Yeah, that is it. Yeah. So they decide to go to the Gotham University Library. They're going to learn about. Um, uh, they they want to learn about see what kind of history they can get, you know, about time travel and stuff like that. And apparently it's like forbidden. You can't, there are, set, there are things called like time cops at this time. And, you know, they, they sense that there's a time machine. They destroy it. Like it's, it's almost like the science police in a way, like, you know, but not really. So mm -hmm. anyway, when they're trying to look at um, 1986 or look into the past, time travel, inquiry recorded, files restricted, federal access only. Data lost to nuclear conflict. So there's that nuclear thing again, where sometime between, you know, DC's 20th century and some specified point in the future, there's going to be some kind of, for lack of a better phrase, great disaster or nuclear war. And Cosmic Boy, we touched on that in Cosmic Boy, where he was like, what's all this nuclear stuff? This isn't supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. That's, no, it's supposed to be for the good, not bad. So whether they are continuing that narrative or um, like here, Rip Hunter says, nuclear conflict, no wonder society isn't more advanced. They probably spent years rebuilding. Yeah, and then that's it. The, the time thing gets, to, and I don't know, I guess next issue, we'll find out how they get back. So, you know, again, to touch on things that are happening in Cosmic Boy with Superboy, Time, time Trapper, this isn't directly related, but it's still, they're still trying to parse out what the immediate future is for DC Comics, not to mention a thousand years later. It makes me wonder if um, uh, Dan Jurgens was ever involved in the discussions about how Levitz was going to address the whole uh, super lack of Superboy thing. Right. And, and, or, or was Dan uh, seeing what was going on in Legion or uh, knew, knew generally of uh, the, the whole change in Superman mythos and just started to run with it. Not to the, not to the, the point of, of, uh, being too heavy handed with it, but just kind of playing around the edges and, uh, and having some fun along the way. I mean, you have to imagine booster gold is the preeminent solo title superhero post-crisis, right? Mm -hmm. He's wrapped up into the future because he's from the future and he has a Legion ring. So yeah, they they I he had to get the okay for that, you know, somewhere along the way. That's true. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe he was. Maybe he was just privy to that. Maybe they said, well, here now we have an opportunity to use your book to further this idea of what time is going to be post crisis, mm -hmm. and the few times we're going to let you play with the Legion, make sure you talk to Paul Levitz. Yeah, you know, I could totally see that because for me, I know reading. Booster Gold, I was like, how does one guy get to be both writer and artist on a new book? And he's relatively not, for my purposes, he was a new guy, Dan yeah. Jurgens. I was like, who's Dan Jurgens? He was on Warlord and other stuff prior to this. Um, wasn't he also? Yeah, he did a couple other miniseries and things like that. But I didn't, I didn't really know who he was, you know. Mm -hmm. But they trusted him to do this book, and it was a moderate success. So, um and and 30 plus years later he's still around. He's still around. He's still <laughs> around. So 
So curious, just some curious dialogue to help continue our story, trying to map out this um, post-crisis mm -hmm. DC universe. So, um, the only other thing I have left is just one other feat, one or two feedback things. Do you have anything else? I do not. All right. Well, let's let's finish with that. Um, so this was from Mike A. Back in August, about episode twenty nine. Uh, and this is about the Starfinger episode and issue. Just finished listening to another stellar episode, pun originally not intended, but kept it anyway, he writes. Uh, while not much happened in this issue, I did enjoy it quite a bit, especially the art. I noticed the same idiosyncrasy in Starfinger's speech patterns, which we also mentioned. Um, I think the reason I was drawn to the story was due to my fascination with star-themed villains such as Evil Star, Star Tar, Star Sapphire, etc., etc. And then, do you have a comment for that? I was just, I, yeah, I, I'm just gonna. Uh, uh, Evil Star is one of my favorite, based on one appearance in one Green Lantern comic I got early on. So, <laughs> see, I'm with you. Same thing with the Wanderers. Like, I don't know why I like these people. But then he also writes in to further our conversation about Zoom Yukonori, um, which we mentioned uh, in, because um, he had created like a who's who for characters that, speaking of obscure characters within the DC universe, but also his own sort of characters. Um, Mike was exposed to Zoom's work through the Fire and Water podcast network. He eventually created his own spinoff podcast called The Done in One Wonders, where he voiced multiple characters in the audio dramatization of single issue stories from DC's Bronze Age. The framework story was multiverse spanning and included a version of Zoom himself, Solomon Grundy, Terraman, Bizarro, Vartak, Vartox, all as members of Zoom crew. Uh, he was immensely talented as an artist and creator, had one of the best speaking voices Mike had ever heard. He did pass away tragically at the end of 2019, uh, but he banked several episodes of his podcast to be aired for months after his passing. So he encourages us to go check that out. And uh, I'll go, we'll put that in the show notes. We'll put the link to that podcast in the, in the show notes. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. So thank you, Mike, for furthering, uh, giving us a little more information on on Zoom. I had speaking of uh, the uh, Zooms, um, Zooms who, which you know, of course, you 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 put me onto that uh, some time ago now, but uh, I saw on Twitter, I think uh, somebody had uh, acquired a copy of one of the issues. Yeah, I have Zoom one put together. Yeah. You, you yeah. did too. Yeah, you do too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, man, I'm, I'm so jealous. I, I would love to have, um, one of those as well. I think I sent you the link where you can download it digitally. I thought I emailed you that. Oh, you check. I will check that then. <laughs> yeah. On one of the previous <laughs> correspondence. Yeah. It's, you can get it now digitally. You can download those things. Great. It's fantastic. It's beautiful. And then lastly, Ben Lyons writes in about tales of the Legion. I mean, Legion project podcast 31 Great episode says somehow I hadn't heard the story on Tyrox design by Mike Grell and wow, wow. The seventies were a wild time. Sabotaging a character like that is a weird choice. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. Although uh, he showed up in one of these issues that I read with Universo. Was it? Uh... Oh no, it was the, the treasury, the, the, um, Wedding of Lightning Lad and Saturn mm. Girl. Uh, uh, I, it was only because Ron Vidar shows up. I just casual quick flip through it. But Tyrox, I forgot that he's in that issue. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's that's one of the nice things about doing this. Um, our read through of, of this this volume of the Legion is just all the little fun uh, bits, behind the scene bits, and uh, I yeah, it, it's it, it's a wonder comic books get made uh, given. <laughs> the machinations there sometimes, but yeah, it's it's fun to discover those things. I think that wraps us up for this first part of the Universal Project. We will mm -hmm. be back again to take a look at Legion of Superheroes issue number 33. And we will 
follow all the way through all four ports before we, you know, um, we're not going to do anything in between. We're just going to hit these issues uh, and take a look and see how this how this baby ends. Yeah. Can't wait. Yeah. Should be fun. Yeah. You can reach me, Peter, at thedailyrios.com or... Me at longboxreview at gmail.com. Excellent. And as always, long live the Legion Project Podcast. See you. Bye-bye.